call the BZA meeting to order here this morning. And our first order of business is we have a, a request for an extension. Um, Mr. Dixon, would you please read the uh, letter for a request of extension? All right, uh, May 25th, 2020, mm. 2022 letter from Clark R. Schaefer. Um, on behalf of the above referenced applicant, um, please consider this letter a request for a one year extension of the decision in the above reference case. Since the decision, the applicant has been diligently working to obtain the necessary governmental approvals to allow the use. However, the following circumstances have delayed the completion of these tasks. The Carroll County Health Department required upgrades for the existing historical dwelling as part of the building permit process. Furthermore, the Carroll County Health Department would not permit percolation testing based on a country in use at first because the Health Department was concerned there was not enough usable land outside of the agricultural preservation easement, which affects limited edges of the property for a septic system. The, this necessitated the, the applicant to apply for and appear before the Carroll County Agricultural Advisory Board to secure approval for a septic overlay on agricultural preservation easement property, which approval was granted. However, it was then found that key staff within the health department had an excessive workload and delayed further perk testing. So that's the reason. Okay, and that, that case <clears throat> is the uh, country inn and wedding venue um, on Old Bachman Valley Road. The big brick house right down the street from you. Is that the one that sat down in the yes. bottom of the valley? Yes. Okay. So that's that's just a just to put a site um, Is your with, with the request. So what what do we think, guys? And, and what was the what was the requested time? One year. One year. One year. <coughs> um, have they had other changes, other um, requests for extensions? No, this should be the first one. You're not. You're only allowed to one year, and that's it. So. Right. I don't see any reason why not. I don't either. Okay, I'll entertain okay. a motion. I move that in case. What are we talking about? Uh, case 6368. In case 6368, we grant a one year extension. Seconded. Seconded. Okay, we'll have a second. Any further discussion on the motion? All those in favor, aye. 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 All opposed, no. Motion carries. So we will go ahead and get Ms. Vance to um, write them a letter and we've, we've um, given them a one year extension. Okay. Oh, I didn't, I didn't realize that was you back there, but very good. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay. Have a good one. You too. Okay. So our 9 o'clock agenda item is uh, case number 6397, um, a request for conditional use of installation of a 12,000-gallon petroleum storage tank. Mr. Dixon, you want to go ahead and introduce the file for us, please? All right. Case 6397, a request for conditional use for the installation of a 12,000-gallon petroleum storage tank. The site is located at 7800 Bick Court, Woodbine, Maryland, on property zone 12, or I I2, Heavy Industrial District and Election District 14, by Weak Care Denali in care of Jason Brown. Code of Public Local Laws and Ordinances, Section 158.080, 158.082, and 158.157. A site visit is tentatively scheduled for Wednesday, June 15th at 20, June 15th, 2022 at approximately 10:15 a.m. In the file of this matter, we have the following documents. Site minutes for the case. There is a response to Joe Vance's request to various state and local agencies from Thomas Harris Permits and Inspections. Comments: A building permit is required for the tank and supporting foundation and electrical permit is required for any associated electrical work. There is a June 9, 2022 letter from Linda D. Eisenberg, Secretary to the Planning Commission. 
After having reviewed the information contained in the attached analysis, the facts as presented in the application, the relevant portions of the plan, and in accordance with the land use article, this conditional use request, if granted, is consistent with the policies, timing of the implementation of the plan, timing of development, timing of rezoning development patterns, land uses, and densities or intensities. There is a June 10, 2022 memo from Abigail Rogers, planning technician. The above reference BZA case has been reviewed for consistency with the policies and recommendations <coughs> contained in the 2014 Carroll County Master Plan, as amended in 2019, the Carroll County Water and Sewer Master Plan, and other functional plans. The staff finding is that this request is consistent with the 2014 Carroll County Master Plan, as amended in 2019, and would not have an adverse effect on the current use of the property. hearing notice uh, for, was posted in the newspaper Ooh. looks like June t that can't be right all right I'm not sure what the date is on this because I don't see it here <laughs> so I'll skip that all right there's a response to Joe Vance's request to various state and local agencies from J.P. Smith, Jr., Program Manager, Ag Land Preservation Program. Uh, J.P. Smith, Jr., Ag Preservation Program Manager, uh, no comments at this time. This property is not in Ag Preservation. There is a response to Joe Vance's request from Janet O'Meara, Bureau Chief Resource Management, and for comments, it has no comments. There's a response to Joe Vance's request to various state and local agencies from Laura Mateus, Bureau Chief, Development Review. Uh, comments, a site plan shall be processed through the Bureau of Development Review for Chapter 155. There's a response to Joe Vance's request to various state and local agencies from Jay Voigt, Zoning Administrator. Comments, uh, no comments. Hearing notice was posted. May 31st, 2022, by Scott Robinson, Zoning Inspector. Conditional use for installation of 12,000 gallon above ground petroleum storage tank. I see an April 21st, 2022 letter from Jay Voigt to, well, to whom it may concern. The property located at 7800 Kabick Court, Woodbine, Maryland, is zone I-2, heavy industrial. At this location, we care Denali compost, yard waste, and woody materials while also blending soils. This is a principal permitted use in the I-2 zoning district as defined in the Carroll County Zoning Ordinance. See a few uh, documents from uh, AST installation. I guess about the storage tank. I would ask that the file be entered into evidence. So moved, seconded. Okay, all in favor of entering the file into evidence, say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. <laughs> we'll enter the file into evidence. Um, before we get started this morning, um, if you haven't signed in on the sign-in sheet on the side, please do that uh, before you leave today. Um, make sure that when you leave, you leave by the same door as what you did so that you can turn your temporary badges in. If you plan on testifying here today, could you go ahead and uh, please stand and raise your right hand and take the oath? Do you swear, do you, raise your right hand, do you swear or affirm under penalties of perjury that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, sir. Very good. You can go ahead and come to the microphone. Yeah. yeah. 
right, right up here. Have a seat. And state your name, address, and occupation, and spell for the record your last name. My name is Jason Brown. Brown like the color, but with an E at the end. I'm with uh, We Care Denali. Uh, business address is 7800 Cabot Court, Woodbine, Maryland. Okay, so we're here. You can go ahead and present your uh, your case as, as far as um, uh, what your request is for and, and, and why. Sure. Uh, we're just trying to update our systems. I, I think this uh, new tank will be safer. Um, will be is, is more it's gonna have a fuel management system on it it's gonna have more safety barriers around it more a harder foundation and um, just updating an antiquated system currently so I think it'll be uh, better for the long run for everyone and uh, I'm just curious wh why are you even here because just in case there was questions I, but I, no 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 why why did this come before the Board of Zoning Appeals because it's over 10,000 gallon I wish Mr. Voigt was here to answer that question. <laughs> I, I couldn't tell you. I'm actually uh, the fuel company that we use, Carol Fuel. Mm -hmm. They're the ones installing it. Um, so they're, they're managing the process for us because they're the experts on this. They do this uh, for a lot of people. So I was, I'm personally here just in case there was any questions or, or um, any feedback. And do, do you know if you need variances from any of the – it, it, the request is just for a conditional use of installation of a 12,000 gallon petroleum tank. It doesn't say anything about um, variances, sure. uh, uh, distances to other properties. Do you know if there are any? I, I don't believe so. From the, the conversations I've had, we just need to be 100 feet off <coughs> the property line, which we are planning on that because we have a drive aisle for both, both sides of the tank, which will give us plenty of space. So. Um, I just thought this was part of the process in general. Okay, and, and I was just wondering what triggered you to come here. <clears throat> sure. In, in, and, I, and I didn't know whether it was gallonage, and I, and I see there is no request for variance from um, neighboring property lines because that's what we get into a lot of times yeah. with fuel storage tanks. And this will be for diesel fuel, on-road diesel fuel. On and off-road diesel. So half the tank will be for on-road, the other half for off-road. Okay. So. I have a question. Go ahead. You mentioned, sir, that you have a, this is a replacement tank. Yeah, so we we currently have like um, the above ground, like a, t a couple of one thousand gallon tanks and a two thousand gallon tank. So this is to consolidate everything and then uh, better safety measures around it. This was a system that we when we purchased the company, this was in place, and our company has a lot higher standards. So we've been working on this for about a year. Will the replacement the will the old tanks be removed? Yes, sir. It will be removed. Okay. Yes, Thank sir. you. And they're presently above ground, and this will be underground. No, they're presently above ground, and the new system is above ground as well. It's also, but yes, of course, you got to go by all the regulations with the containment and everything else. Yep. So that's that's yep. that's not our purview. No, and again, that's one reason why we're leaning on our fuel vendor. They're they're the experts on this. They they implement these in a lot of different locations for different companies. So we just, we let the experts handle it for us. Any other questions? Any summation comments? Uh, thank you for your time and your consideration. Sir, you, any comments to make? Uh, no, I'm Cliff Engel, I'm here, Chief of Solid Waste. Gotcha. And, uh, we're the landlord <laughs> for their operation. <laughs> I was just here in support of it and to, to answer any questions. And, and there's, there's no opposition? No, no. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, guys. Hearing and record of this case is now closed. In accordance with the Open Meetings Act of Maryland, the board will now consider the case. No objection. I don't really know if there's anything to consider. Yeah. It's clearly not going to have any adverse effects. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, it, it, it is in the industrial zone. I mean, it's... Um, it's actually in improving the safety considerations. Yeah. So it's actually a, a benefit. Yep. Okay. <coughs> Guys, I'll entertain a motion. Uh, move that the board uh, approve the request in case number 6397 for the installation of a 12,000 gallon petroleum storage tank. Do I have a second? I'll second. 
Okay, any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor, aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Motion carries. Our oral decision will become final upon a written decision which will be issued within 30 days unless otherwise extended by this board. The board's decision may be appealed by filing a petition for judicial review with the clerk of the circuit court for Carroll County in accordance with the provisions of Chapter 200, Title 7 of the Maryland Rules of Procedure. The appeal must be filed within 30 days of the date of the board's written decision. Thank you very much, and this hearing is adjourned, and we will be back at 10.30. Thank you. <coughs>
call the BZA meeting to order. A um, couple of housekeeping details. If you haven't signed in on the sheet for this case on the uh, clipboard on the side, make sure you do that before, the, before you leave. And when you leave today, please leave by the same door as you came in so that you can turn your badges in so they're not looking for you later in the day. Okay? Um, with that, Mr. Dixon, would you go ahead and introduce the file? We have before us um, a request for conditional use for commercial kennel, kennel for more than 10 dogs and distance variances. Okay, uh, case 6401, a request for conditional use for a commercial kennel for more than 10 dogs and distance variances. The site is located at 2331 Braddock Road, Mount Airy, Maryland, on property zone A, Agricultural District and Election District 9 by Dustin Moser. Code of Public Local Laws and Ordinances, Sections 158.070E1I and 158.040. Site visit is tentatively scheduled for Wednesday, June 15th, 2022 at approximately 9.45 a.m. In the file of this matter, we have the following documents. There's a response to Joe Vance's request to various state and local agencies from Thomas Harris, per, uh, Thomas Harris Permits and Inspections. Uh, comments, any new structures will, will require permits. Any areas open to the public shall comply with the Maryland Accessibility Code. There is a response to Joe Vance's request to various state and local agencies from Abigail Rogers. She is a... planning technician. There's a June 10th, 2022 memo. It states the above reference BZA case has been reviewed for consistency with the policies and recommendations contained in the 2014 Carroll County Master Plan as amended in 2019, the Carroll County Water and Sewer Master Plan and other functional plans. The staff finding is that this request is consistent with the 2014 Carroll County Master Plan as amended in 2019 and would not have an adverse effect on the current use of the property. There is a June 9, 2022 letter from Linda D. Eisenberg to the board. After having reviewed the information contained in the attached analysis, the facts as presented in the application, the relevant portions of the plan, and in accordance with the provision set forth in the land use article, this conditional use request, if granted, is consistent with the policies, timing of the implementation of the plan, timing of development, timing of rezoning, develop, development patterns, land uses, and densities or intensities. There's a notice of public hearing for this case. Let's see, I see a, a plan from JNM Engineering LLC. There is a response to Joe Vance's request to various state and local agencies from Matt Shipley, Carroll County Environmental Health Department. Proposed use may not be acceptable unless it is demonstrated that there is an adequate water supply and adequate area for the installation of an initial and two replacement septic systems for the proposed use and any existing uses of this property. There, there is a response from Dawn Kenna of the Humane Society, Animal Control Officer Dispatch, um, and her comments is no comment. There is a response to Joe Vance's request from J.P. Smith, Jr., Program Manager, Ag Land Preservation Program. This comment, no comments at this time. This property is not in Ag Preservation. There is a response from Janet O'Meara, Bureau Chief, Resource Management, to Joe Vance's request to various state and local agencies. And comments is no comments. There is a response to Joe Vance's request to various state and local agencies from Laura Mateus, Bureau Chief, Development Review. Comments, a site plan shall be uh, processed in accordance with Chapter 155. 
There is a response to Joe Vance's request from uh, Jay Voigt, Zoning Administrator. Comments? No comment. Hearing notice was posted May 31st, 2022 by Inspector Scott Robinson. Joe Vance sent a request to various state and local agencies May 26, 2022. And then there's this conditional use for commercial kennel for more than 10 dogs. There's another plan from JNM Engineering LLC. I would ask that the file be entered into evidence. So moved. Seconded. Okay. Been moved and second, seconded uh, to move the file into evidence. All those in favor, aye. Aye. All opposed, no. We will move the file into <clears throat> evidence. Looking in the audience, it doesn't appear that any of you have been before the Board of Zoning Appeals before, so let me, inter let me, let me try to uh, um, explain the process that we're going to have this, this morning. The applicant, Mr. Moser, will have his op the opportunity to present his case, and after uh, he, he gives his testimony and any witnesses that he may call, uh, you all in the audience will have the opportunity to ask questions of their testimony, not to give your own testimony at that point, but ask questions of their, of their testimony. The board members will have the opportunity to do the same. And then after they've presented their case, anyone from the, uh, the public can go to the microphone and at that point you can give your own testimony. And again, board members and Mr. Moser will have the opportunity to ask questions of your testimony only. Uh, there'll be summation comments, and then the, the board will determine the case. So if you um, are plan on testifying here today, uh, could you uh, uh, please stand and raise your right hand? And sir, you can remain seated. So oh, can you? Okay. So could you please <clears throat> stand and raise your right hand if you're going to testify today? Do you swear or affirm under the penalties of perjury that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Very good. You can be seated. M Mr. Moser, uh, could you go ahead and come to uh, the, the table there where the microphone is? And uh, before anyone <coughs> speaks, make sure that you state your name, address, occupation, and spell for the record your last name. Okay. Mr. Moser. So you're here, you're here today uh, requesting a conditional use for commercial kennel for more than 10 dogs and distance variances. Can you explain what you plan on doing and why you need the variances? Um, uh, God, I'm so nervous, I don't even know. Uh, we're, we have six dogs already, so um, you know, in the kennel that we build, it's attached to our home in the garage and we can fit maybe eight to 10 dogs. So I included like R6 in that total. So um, just wanna have like a boarding kennel for overnight stays. Um, and you know, we have a fence yard and everything. And uh, so I, don't, I don't know what else. So, <laughs> so you presently have six dogs of your own. I just wanna get right. this straight. Yes. And you, you wanna be able to board dogs overnight for a week for vacation stays for people or going on vacation correct yes okay. yeah eight to ten we can fit in the kennel area our dogs stay in the house inside so they won't be a part of like the inside kennel but it is attached to the house like we closed it in completely and the garage doors are off now and they <coughs> siding and everything so um the dogs will be it's attached to our home so it's not like a separate building we don't have any other buildings to put dogs or anything so that's kind of why it was 10 or more because 
of the six I just added as a part of how many we're going to be on the property. So. Okay. Uh, any other description of what you want to do is? Uh, I think that's it. I mean, not like a doggy daycare or anything. It's just overnight stays only. Um, like I said, eight to ten dogs possibly that we could get in there. And um, I don't, I don't know what else. That's kind of like what what uh, I was planning. <laughs> okay. So. so, so with that, does anyone in the audience have any questions of, of um, Mr. Moser's testimony? Sure. Go, go, to the, go to the microphone. Roger Black, last name B-L-A-C-K, 2323 Braddock Road. Um, I'm behind and just the corner lot uh, uh, a bunch of yours. Um, noise is a concern. Um, we didn't know you have six dogs. Right. <laughs> um, we did see that, and I say we, I did see um, that you closed the garage off. Mm -hmm. So there's no other structure being no, sir. built. No. Okay. Um, how long would dogs, multiple dogs, be outside in your fenced-in property? Well, we would be monitoring them, so it, we, it's not, they're not going to be left outside by themselves, you know, for responsibility of, if one escaped or something, we need to be aware of it. So, you know, I, I don't know exactly because I don't have a lot of experience, but they won't be left alone outside. That's, that's like not, I don't know if we can even, you know, allow that. So if they got in a fight or if they were, they were being obnoxious, you know, you have to bring them back, back inside, obviously. So. Um, do you have to be licensed? To have a commercial kennel? I mean, just this license, but not. Does the county require uh, any kind of, you know? <clears throat> no. Wait a minute, wait a minute. And maybe more so for the commissioner's distance variance what does that entail uh, it's set it's set back um, I mean, what is the requirement and what uh, the yeah, I haven't seen the <coughs> and, and, and I don't mean to interrupt you mr. black but can you look that up um, mr. Voigt Jay Voigt is in the back of the room and he is our zoning administrator and he, he can answer the one question that you had well, there's Boyd. a question I believe raised if there was any other license required other than this um, hearing conditional use a Humane Society for commercial kennels require licensing through the Humane Society so that would have to be done That's a I mean a no business license uh, I have, I'm every right. every business in the state of Maryland needs a so, business yeah, license. I, mean, I have that yeah gotcha. 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 I started that for my own dogs mm -hmm. as I breed those dogs too sure. Mr. Voigt, what is the setback requirement for a kennel? If it's a kennel for more than 10 dogs, it's twice the section 158040, which is 200 feet. So in this case, it would be 400 feet if the kennel's for more than 10 dogs. And, and what's the distance from the structure to the property? Uh, I guess oh. your uh, property is closest. I mean, I have the, um, to, to, uh, we'll, we'll, you can testify after he's finished, but if you can't answer that question, yeah, I don't know. just, 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 just say, I don't, I don't know. And we do have uh, uh, something in the file here yeah. about the, the setbacks that, that should clarify that question, Mr. Black. Um, in the statement uh, of uh, presented or evidence presented, <clears throat> uh, referenced two septic systems. That's that's a Carroll County Health Department, um, I guess, rule or law for uh, for this type of use. No, for the for the residents. I am not following, because the resident size requires to. No, every. That's what 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 Mr. Dixon read is standard language that as long as it doesn't interfere with the septic and an area for two reserves in case the initial septic fails and that and that has nothing to do with the dogs that has to do with the residents sir I, I'm 
I'm not, I'm not giving testimony. No, 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 no I, 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 I understand. understand. Question is. And, and because there's no additional structure being built, there's no impingement on the existing septic, I presume. Um, how about disposal of dog waste? Right. Um, uh, I mean, that's. I don't know right now. I mean, that, that, I have to figure that a, out. It's yeah. a concern. I mean, I mean, six dogs. I, I wasn't aware you had six dogs. I thought you had three. Right. Um, and that becomes an issue. Could become an issue. Mm -hmm. Um, we're all very close within, you know, 500 feet. Uh, I understand. Yeah. I'll, I'll definitely have a way about that. I know. mean, again, is there a, there's no county requirement for disposal? Uh, of no, th I, that's, that's not up to the Board of Zoning Appeals. Who is it up to? I, I don't know. I mean, it, it's not in our purview. But it's a very valid question for a zoning variance. Okay. Mr. Voigt has raised his hand again. Mr. Voigt. Uh, once again, the uh, Humane Society requires licensing for commercial kennels, and they do do inspections to ensure that the facility is kept in a safe, clean manner and healthy for the dogs that they're keeping. That doesn't, I, I'm not trying to be the hard whatever, but <clears throat> if you had, if you maxed out 10 animals, I'll follow the regulations of whatever the humane I mean, society. I'd, I'd love to know the regulations, yeah. how to, too. where to, I, I mean, know. what what do you plan yeah. on, how do you plan on disposing of eight to ten dogs? So. There, there is a company that you can call to come out, and I've considered maybe doing that, um, duty calls. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but uh, it's a waste management for pet right. waste. So I mean, that, that could be an option as far as um, yeah. once I figure out what, what the actual... Humane Society has to say about it. I'll be sure to follow what their protocol is. You know, and and what recourse as you know residents, not so much to you, do we have if it becomes a problem? If you decide this is an acceptable uh, use, what recourse do we have? Um, the, as far the, as noise, as far as odors, the, the zoning office, which Mr. Boyd heads up. Just for correction, uh, Mr. Mm. Mayo, noise issues are now handled by the Sheriff's Department, but if there are any other violations, uh, uh, such as it becomes uh, an issue with the neighbors with uh, dogs getting loose and stuff like that, then it is a zoning violation and there are um, financial penalties that we can assess against the owner. Um, I can't think of anything right now that I have. Okay, and, and Mr. Black, you have the opportunity to present your own testimony at a later point okay. in time. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions from anyone in the audience? If, go to the microphone, please, and remember to state your name, address, and occupation, and spell for the record your last name. Marion Wright, last name E-N-R-I-G-H-T. I am right next door to Mr. Black, and I... I I'm a supervisor. Um, my my only question, other than Rogers already asked, is so you have six dogs already, so you're planning on kenneling ten more? Eight to ten, yeah, whatever we can fit in the kennel. Yeah. In addition, or just wait, wait a minute, it's it's in addition, in addition to the six. Yes, yeah, because the six stay in my home. They're inside dogs, so they're not out in the kennel. Not in the kennel, but they're outside at times. So, in, in addition to, so we're, yes, there's gonna be a lot of barking. I, I love animals, yeah. so don't get me wrong. I love animals, but potentially 16 dogs barking at any given time mm -hmm. is a large nuisance. I love being outside. I love the outdoors, and if I want to sit outside and enjoy, you know, the animals running around, which we have a lot of wildlife, which none of us are hunters. We enjoy that wildlife. Right. The more dogs you bring in, the more wildlife gets scared and run into the roads and cause accidents. Not that you have control over that, right. but the more dogs and the more noise, the noise disturbs us, the noise disturbs animals. Mm -hmm. That road is very dangerous. From your driveway down to ours, people fly up and down that road. Oh, yeah. It's dangerous. It. They currently have speed signs, right. one right at our driveway and one at the other end of Braddock. Mm -hmm. 
you know, saying, hey, you're going over 40. People do 50 plus. Miss Enright, you'll have the opportunity for testimony. You're right, you're right, I'm sorry. So 10, Questions. 10 additional, he already asked about the waste. You're gonna address that. That's all my questions. Okay, and again, you'll have the opportunity for your own testimony. Thank you. Okay. How do you spell your last name again? E-N-R-I-G-H-T. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I didn't ask, do you guys have any? No, never mind. Go ahead. Hi, Monique Urig, 2353 Braddock Road. It's U-H-R-I-G. Um, a couple questions that, that we had was, um, where on the property will the dogs be outside? They're inside my garage. Attached but when they're garage. outside, will they have full run of your property? Yeah, in the backyard. It's fenced already. Right, mm -hmm. right. Um, we noticed that there's some, some sort of temporary fencing, because we're, we're right next to you. I think we have the biggest skin in the game regarding this because we are the closest neighbor to them. The only thing that separates their house from ours is a common driveway. Um, we notice you have a goat. Mm -hmm. We hear it all the time. <laughs> um, so, and, and, and it seems that that goat is right at the property line because we can see it from our driveway. Um, so is that going to be, you know, our concern is will the dogs be when they're all outside, you're six, and however many you have boarding, and we understand you may not have, you know, 10 dogs boarding at the same time. Who knows? Um, will they all have access at that spot? Because we have a dog, and we all have large lots, and we enjoy taking our dog off leash in our own yard. And she knows, she listens, she has good recall, she stays in our yard. But if she sees all of these dogs at that temporary fence that you have now installed there, that's very close. The um, temporary fence was to train our, the goats to, so because they're not used to electric fence, I just put that as a barrier. So if they got out, it would be easier to get them back in. So that was like for the goats. The dogs won't be leaving our backyard. Okay. Yeah, that, that was just kind of something as a barrier to keep my goats from escaping out of the electric fence. But I have not yet to let them out of the, uh, their enclosure okay. to get into the electric because I, I haven't had a chance to, to do that. So. Will you, how many goats do you currently have? Three. Will you be having more? No. no. Will you be having more animals other than the goats and the dogs no. No. on the property? Okay. The goats were to clear out the, all the brush and debris that's I get in that. there. <laughs> I get that. And they cleared the patch that they have already been in, but uh, I got to get them used to the electric. And, and they went through it once, so I'm trying to refigure out. We've had issues with goats escaping into our property and terrorizing our property, which is why I'm asking. We've got a little bit of PTSD from that, so that's why I'm asking that question. Okay. Well. I don't even know if the goats would be staying, honestly. They're more of a headache than, than yeah. anything, so I, I, don't, I doubt if they'll be staying, honestly. Okay. They are kind of a nuisance to me. <laughs> well, I, I, that'll come later. That's a sound issue for me as well. Thank you. Anyone else? Board members, questions of Mr. Moser's testimony. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't see you raise your <clears throat> hand. My name is Paul Dana. I live at 2320 Braddock Road, Mount Airy. And spell for the record your last name, please. Pardon? Spell for the record your last name. A N N A. I understand. I guess I want clarification for myself. I understand if this is approved, he'd have the ability to have 10 dogs. Is there a limit over and above the 10 dogs? I mean, if he decides later on he wants to put an outbuilding on his property, um, is he free to do that and then bring in more dogs? Um. This board can set um, limitations as to the total number of dogs, um, but they're, he's before us now because he's going to have over 10 dogs. But he had the opportunity, would he have the opportunity to come back in front of the board and try to advance that? If, 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 if we put a limitation on the number of dogs that he could have, uh, and if he <clears throat> went over that number of dogs, he would have to come back before this board for approval. And how would that be regulated? Um, 
if there was a complaint uh, to the zoning administrator, administrator's office. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we don't normally give you a second bite at the apple, but go ahead, Mr. Black. Go to the microphone, please. You, you, you just stated that on the uh, 10 or more, or is, how's it worded? For more than 10. So there is no upper limit. There, there is, the, this board has the ability to place a maximum number on, on, on the number that he's requesting. And are you looking I'm not currently looking at doing any more building so, or anything. So what will that limit be? The board will discuss that based on testimony when we, when we discuss the case. In front of us? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, we, we don't do anything behind closed doors, sir. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay. But I mean, that, 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 will, that, will, that will happen today. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Please come to the microphone and... Your name, address, occupation, and spell for the record your last name. Janet Allgood, A-L-L-G-O-O-D, 2319 Braddock Road, Woodbine. Okay, go, go ahead. And remember, you're asking questions of his testimony. Right. My question is, I, I'm next door to you. Um, with the dr a driveway in between, but I can see your property. I can see your fence, your back garden. Now, if he had all of the dogs outside in that enclosure at the same time and they were making too much noise, I would not be able to sit out in my back garden and enjoy it. Is there um, some way that you would say, I could say, look, I'm outside at the moment and your dogs are making too much noise and I can't enjoy myself. If they, if they were, I mean, I don't, has it been an issue like so far? I mean. Uh, no, I've heard your um, dogs, mm -hmm. um, but they've not been constant, but right. that you, you only have um, six at the moment. Right. Yeah. But Whenever add, they get rowdy. Add 10 more to that and if they were all outside right. and I was trying to sit out. Right, I, I understand that. And, and if, they, if our own dogs get too rowdy, we bring them inside. Right. So, you know, I would follow through with that. I mean, I don't want to cause any issues with the neighbors or anything. So uh, I, would, I would be as respectful as I could with the noise, you know, as, as much as I could and bring them inside. They, they won't be outside alone. I can, like, guarantee that, you know what I mean, that they, they will not be left alone outside. So any time that the dogs are outside, there is somebody there? There will be, yeah. I mean, our, we're at home when our dogs are outside, so they're never left outside while we're gone. So. And if they were too noisy, you would bring them in? I do now, yes. Okay. And, and if that were the case, and, yeah, if you said something to me i could address that that would be just yeah. be my main concern yeah yeah all right i would be yeah i'm respectful and i can handle that yeah absolutely <laughs> okay <laughs> thank you any other questions of mr moser's testimony do you have any do you want to you want to call him as a witness or just like <clears throat> does the board have any questions oh yeah oh yeah the board <laughs> Good gracious, I'm skipping, I missed the last hurdle. Board members, any questions of Mr. Moser's testimony? I have a concern about the variance requirement. Okay, let's, let's, let's um, <coughs> that'll be a question for Mr. Voigt. Let, let's let's wait and we'll, bring, and we'll bring Mr. Voigt up in the answer. We can't, he's got to demonstrate hardship, practical difficulty, and I, we haven't heard anything about it. Is that what you're suggesting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I... Well, it can be in the file if you've looked at it. Maybe the answer or part of us in there. Hmm. I don't know. Well, the, the, there is a map in there with, with the setbacks, and there is from Mr. Voigt um, a letter stating what the variances are. 
Is it just the one variance that I saw? Not if there's more than one. Really? No, look in the file. Well, the request is for more than one. Yeah, well, because the file, the file says, according to Mr. Voigt's letter, there's one. How far back was that, Lisa? Mr. Voigt, we have a question. The map that we were used that we, is in the file with the setbacks, all of them are under 250 feet. Well, there's a couple of below that are at 300. Did you say it's two times 200, so it would be 400? That's correct. The, the setback for a commercial kennel for 10 dogs or more would be 400 feet. But in your response that's in the file, it said there was only a variance needed from one address. <clears throat> 2320 Braddock Road. Lot is under three acres. That's the reason why it needs... Currently, any lot under three acre would need to be have a variance to it. Um, if it's above three acre, the way it's currently written in the code, um, we do not have to meet that uh, double standard at 400 feet. So it is only just the one variance? As I remember, yes. Okay. <clears throat> so there's 2320 on there. Right here. So the only property that the variance is needed is, is the 20, 2320 Braddock Road, which is, we get this right, to southeast of your actual property. It's, a, it's across down on the left. Yes. And, and like I say, that would be for <coughs> um, any lot under three acres would need to meet the, uh, the 400 foot setback. So all the, other, all the other lots that we're looking at here on the variances are over three acres. And the only one is across yes. the road at 2320 Braddock Road. As I recollect, the rest of them are over three acres. Okay. Well, I'm reading, I'm looking at your initial comment form. Would there be anything after that? Or that would just kind of be it that says about the variance? Um, I don't remember what I wrote on that form. A variance is needed to 2320 Braddock Road. The lot is under three acres. So that would be, this would be like the final... That would be the one lot that would need a variance from. Okay. The only lot. Okay. Mm. And, and all another. The, all the other lots, in my understanding, when I checked, were over three mm. acres. Okay. And the other question, Mr. Voigt, for clarification, is the variance request is not from the property line, but it is from the actual dwelling where the 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 place where the dogs will be housed. Is that correct? It's under three acres, if I remember correctly, it's from the property line. From the property line, and if it's over three acres, but there is, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. matter. Okay. And I'm just gonna check here real fast, just to be sure. <clears throat> okay, thank you. This is over three acres. Okay, it says here that, um, any residential lot less than three acres in the Ag or Conservation District um, would be from the property line. Anything property line. over that, if, if a variance would need it, would be from that dwelling. So all those are over three acres? Yeah, so all these lots, you can see they're over three acres. Um, Mr. Moser, can, can you tell us what the acreage is of your? Five. You've got five acres, okay. So that's the only one. That's the way down here. Oh. Yeah, but it's not, that's, that's more than, that's more than the, 
is 400 feet from here. Let's say take a way down. This is 277. This is there. Yeah, but it's contiguous properties. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, um, Miss, Mr. Moser, could, could you explain why you need that variance to that property? Because could, the property is under um, three acres. And, and you couldn't, could you locate on your property um, the, the kennel that it, you would not need that variance or that wouldn't be, or would that not be possible? I think it's from the property. What is it? Prop from the property line, or okay. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Keep okay. Keep so the, the practical difficulty here is that just the existence of that lot across the road triggers this. It's nothing that you've done. Mm -hmm. That'd be correct. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Any question? Any questions, Ms. Eckerd? Um, what do you anticipate that your maximum number of dogs might be? Well, with our dogs included, is that is that a <clears throat> part of it as well, be, or just the boarding dogs? Well, your dogs are going to count in the final count. So, okay. so there's going to be a maximum of ten that will fit into our enclosures in in the garage in the kennel area so conceivably you could be looking for six approval for 16 right dogs okay and are you currently doing uh, like boarding now for anybody no. no so do you anticipate this being well i guess 10 dogs but like Word of mouth? Will you advertise? Well, I, I'm, I've been like, a, um, I've been a hairstylist for <laughs> 17 years. Okay. And a lot of my clients, you know, they're very trusting in me to um, take their dogs in while they're away on vacations. So I'll just you have my own base of clients already. So I don't necessarily see myself um, doing too much advertising. I mean, maybe social media or something like that. But um, that's about it. So this is something that would be secondary to you, people that you're styling their hair, say, hey, we're going to be away this weekend. Right. Do you have room? Right. Okay. Um, the common driveway. Yes, I, we did go back to common driveway. We don't share a driveway with anyone. Is, is that what? You know? Okay, you don't share a driveway with anybody? Okay. That's over next to the goats, is that correct? <clears throat> yeah, both sides of the property have a common driveway, I think. I think. Okay, and that's uh, my apologies. That's that's what I'm remembering. I don't have a, a yeah. photograph of the place. Right. So the when we saw the the fencing to like the left hand side, mm -hmm. I think Mr. Bale commented, "There's goats." So that is not where the dogs will be. No, not at all. Okay, no. they'll be behind the house. Yeah, there's a black iron kind of like fence mm -hmm. there that goes around the whole backyard, and it's just there in the back. Okay. Uh, yeah. No, it's. Okay, any other questions of Mr. Moser's testimony? Um, if you uh, would indulge me a minute, Mr. Moser, you mentioned the breeding dogs. Um, how many dogs do you? Oh, we just have three that um, we were planning to have puppies. They haven't had, have it any yet. You know, they're still pretty young, but. Um, just standard poodles we had. Okay, are you planning to um, continue breeding dogs or selling them? I mean, it what, depends. What's I mean, your business it's plan? It's kind of like how many dogs we have in the kennel. If there's 10 dogs and it's too much, then no, we don't need to, we're not going to have those breeding breeding dogs. Well, if you have, okay, I'm just going to try to do math here. If you've got six dogs of your own and, and one Presumably, you've got a female who has a litter of what, five or six pups. You could then find yourself at you know, at 22 dogs. Mm -hmm. But it's under. Well, the if age they're under two. so many weeks of age, I mean, before you get rid of them, you know, before you rehome them. I'm just thinking about noise levels and mm -hmm. all that sort of stuff. It's it well, the puppies are kept inside. I don't let the I don't really let those puppies around other dogs because of 
different diseases and stuff if they could carry that like uh, distemper or anything from the ground that puppies can pick up without any vaccinations. So, uh, Mr. Voigt's back there again. You have a clarification for us? Uh, yes. I, uh, a, a dog is not considered a dog. It's considered a puppy up until it has its canine teeth. It's a full set of teeth. When does that happen? <laughs> Different breeds. It, it probably varies. Um, so that's why I say it's not a set week, but it's up until they have their, their canine, their full set of teeth. <coughs> they are considered puppies up until then. A follow-up for Mr. Boyd, if I may. Um, for uh, the commercial kennel license, um, includes breeding in that? It can. It can. A commercial kennel, um, the definition of a commercial kennel is breeding and keeping dogs or training dogs. That's all included in a commercial kennel unless the board says otherwise. Okay, thank you, Mr. Boyd, appreciate it. Any other questions of Mr. Moser's testimony? Okay, very good, thank you, Mr. Moser. Now, and at this point in time, uh, if anyone who wants to give their testimony, please come to a microphone. I think that other gentleman wanted yeah. to testify. Yeah, yeah, he, you, you're just going to test. You're just going to testify, correct? You're not yeah. going to be a witness. Right. It was more so. Um, do you want to stand? Yeah. yeah, yeah why don't we go ahead and because it might generate other <laughs> questions uh, from the audience members. So we'll let you go ahead and go first with uh, your testimony. So okay. please come to the microphone. To anything else no, wait a minute. Name, oh. address, occupation, yeah. and spell for the record your last name. My name is Sam Acevedo, A C E V E D O. Um, whoa, 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 whoa. Sorry. S slow <laughs> down. <laughs> no worries. Spell, spell a little bit slower. Mr. Dixon didn't get all that. So it's A C E V as in Victor, E D O, Acevedo. What's your first name? Samuel. Mr. Dixon didn't get it, but neither did I. So. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay, go ahead. Yeah, so um, there wouldn't be any issue with the dogs being not with anyone. Um, I also reside at the property, and um, we take care of all, all, all of our dogs with direct supervision. Um, as far as any noise complaints that we may um, get, we would, of course, address that with, with the direct uh, person creating that complaint or concern. Um, and if in fact we had different sized dogs we would keep like all of our small dogs with our small dogs all of our big dogs with our big dogs so there wouldn't be any issues with um like fights between them or any except like extra noise um as far as like the goats the dogs would not be there as well um all of our dogs would be within the the fenced property um and they would not leave that so that's also another um address i would say um that's pretty much it. I just wanted to, to give that clarity as well. Okay, very good. Okay, does anyone from the audience have any questions of Samuel's testimony? <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Seeing none, board members? No question. Oh, well. um, sir, could you tell me what kind of dogs you presently have? Yeah, so we have two Yorkies, two Yorkshire Terriers, a Golden Retriever, a German Shepherd, and two Standard Poodles. So you've got a mix of large and small dogs. Correct. Three of them are spayed and neutered, so they're not, they're pets. Well, they're all pets, but not like a puppy or something like that. Any other questions? Thank you. Very good. Thank you for your testimony. Okay. Now, whoever wants to come first, come to the microphone to give your own testimony. Go, go, go ahead, please come to the microphone. Remember name, address, and occupation, and spell for the record your last name. Okay, Mary Hutchins Dana, last name H-U-T-C-H-I-N-S hyphen Dana, D-A-N-N-A, 2320 Braddock Road, Mount Airy. And what was the other question? <laughs> Occupation. Occupation. I'm retired. 
Congratulations. Thank you. Well, your last name is Hutchins. I heard a lot of names. I, I, was, I wasn't sure what your name was. Name Hutchins Dana. I signed in and printed if you need to check Hutchins that. Hutchins Dana. Yeah, H-U-T-C-H-I-N-S oh. hyphen D as in David, A-N-N-A. -N -N -A. Okay, and what's okay. your first name? Right, I have and your Mr. Dixon, what's your first name? Mary. Very good, thank you. You're welcome. I had, I came here today because I had more questions or I had thoughts about the kennel. We're all dog lovers, I hope you know that. We have a dog named Charlie who's got a rather robust bark himself. Um, I was more concerned not only about the noise level but the traffic on the road. It was mentioned earlier and there have been so many near accidents and accidents that I was concerned about people have, having increased traffic on Braddock, the buses stop there. Kids come, teenagers drive that road a lot and it's used instead of Liberty Road as a, as a connection between <clears throat> uh, 27 and Woodbine Road. So it's used quite a lot. And we've had more mailboxes cut, <laughs> knocked down by cars on uh, snowy days the cars skid, they end up in interesting places along the, our road. It's on the downhill, it's on the, sh on the shady side of the road. So um, it's really problematic. I know we have speed signs, but they don't work. I don't know who could put, if you go ahead with this, if we could have calming bumps, who do we talk to to get calming um, bumps, or, uh, whatever you call them, <laughs> above? And, and good warnings because if cars are stopped, if we have increased traffic going into your property, and not only you, but your customers will be at a disadvantage. So that's, that's my primary concern. Okay, Mr. Moser, do you have any questions of her testimony? No, I was just gonna say, you know, like we will have certain drop off hours or pick up hours, so they won't be coming like in and out all day long. So, um, you know, that's, one positive thing in my mind that you know we'll right. have that. I don't see it as something that you can control when other people are traveling the road. You know what I mean? That's I have seen people go airborne at the top of that road, so that is of concern. And if the speed bumps aren't doing any good, it's not going to help you. It's not going to help us if there's increased traffic. Okay. Okay, board members, any questions of our testimony? So who would I contact about the speed bumps? <laughs> um, that would be the roads department, the Carroll County Roads Department, because that is a county road. Okay, thank you. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, I'll, wait, wait, wait a minute. No, go go ahead. She's sitting back down. So. Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> My wife weren't here. <coughs> Let the lady go. Ladies. Oh, okay, sat back down. <laughs> If we were at this location right now. Wait, wait please enter, please again, oh, uh, stay, again? stay for the record your, la your uh, name, please. Paul Dana, 2320 Braddock Road, Mount Airy, Maryland, and I'm retired also. If we were at this location right now and you looked at the hill that my wife was talking about and where his, road, his driveway is, it's only a matter of feet from the time that they crown that hill and start coming down that short runway. I've seen personally at least, I mean, two accidents um, coming off that hill. These people, and it's not just kids, it's not a 40 mile an hour zone. Uh, well, it is, but it isn't, if you understand what I mean. So something has to be done. Uh, I mean, it's, it's da that, that driveway is dangerous enough as it is. With additional traffic going in and out, I'm afraid it's only a matter of time before it happens again. <clears throat> if something can be done, like speed bumps or something else, that would be wonderful. But something has to be done, I think. Okay. Any questions of his testimony? Thank you very much.
Monique Urig, U H R I G 2353 Braddock Road, and I'm in finance. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are the closest um, to the proposed kennel, and it is a sound issue for us personally. We lived in a residential neighborhood in Mount, in the town limits of <clears throat> Mount Airy, um, and the reason that we moved and sought out this particular property that we live in right now is because it was very peaceful. It was on a larger piece of property, and the houses weren't on top of one another, and it's been lovely. It's been peaceful. We've been there since 2013. Um, and we, the, the increase in noise for us is a problem. Um, we enjoy, like the other neighbors, sitting outside either in our driveway or out back. And so the increase in noise for us would impact our quality of life. And I understand that Mr. Moser said that, you know, if we let him know, it's not the type of the way these properties are structured, it's not the type of thing that, you know, I can just walk over. It's a rural route, which as you've heard, is a dangerous road. It is a dangerous road. When we pull out of our driveway, our driveway crests at the top of, that, of this hill. We have to look back and forth, back and forth, five and six times before we pull out. So we are also concerned about safety um, for the increase in traffic, and I understand. They may not have, you know, 16 cars coming in and out all at the same time. I understand that. But it's already an existing issue. So to have a business being operated out of this home, it further impacts and compounds the already existing issue of safety on that road for us. Um, you know, we've seen, we've, I myself have had numerous close calls with cars coming up and down that road. We have, you know, kids on dirt bites and things of that nature that dogs could be triggered by sounds i mean and and dogs are like kids it takes one dog to bark and then they all start barking just like one kid cries they all start crying you know so it, it's really for us it's a quality of life issue for us <clears throat> um and we're not trying to um you know impact your way of life or your 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 quality of life we just want to want you to know that we are concerned for our quality of life with the impact of all of the dogs because we have heard your dogs um <clears throat> I will say mostly the little ones um, and the goats, but it's a quality of life issue for us. Um, we like to, you know, have, have people over with their dogs as well. And, you know, we've had an issue with an, a woman walking up and down our, the common driveway next to us. And she was actually on our property at one point. She shouldn't have been on our property. It's private property. But she has a little girl with her what what is the safety precautions um you know one of the things that i thought about is the safety precautions i know you said that there's a fence but if this woman who has no problem walking all over the area i don't know if any of you guys have, have noticed this woman walking all over the place um but she, she takes the little girl with her what happens if she walks up to the fence and wants to pet a dog and you know what kind of issues is that going to raise um these are just the things that that we've thought about you know because like i said we are the closest to you and we can see your property we our tree our property is bordered by 20 year old pine trees but there are some bare spots and they're you know bare at the bottom and we see the temporary fencing for the goat and the goat enclosure right there right as we walk out of our garage um so that's and that's an issue for us and, and for our own dog um, who like i said we like to be able to take off leash and my concern is that we won't be able to do that anymore that's all okay any questions of her testimony <clears throat> mr colwell um miss uh, uh, how long have you been aware of the, the dog noise um past few months we hear dogs and and look i don't expect dogs not to bark they're dogs they're being dogs it's not the dog's fault um but for the past few months and we hear at varying times again it's not constant i think someone else mentioned that it's not constant um but i think six dogs is easier to control certainly than 10 or 20 or 30. 
whatever the number is you set the limit at. Have you uh, ever heard anybody out there um, attempting to quiet the dogs down or taking them in when they got noisy? No. Thank you. <clears throat> I was going to say, like, we don't we don't leave them out unattended. If they if they do bark, we address it, you know, because we don't want to hear that the little dogs barking, you know. So I I do address the dogs, and there are other neighbors around. I hear their dogs all the time too. I mean, it's you know, it's pretty natural to, I mean. Okay. Thank you. Any anyone else want to give testimony? <clears throat> Go ahead. <clears throat> Again, Mary Enright, E N R I G H T. Uh, currently supervisor, but about to retire. So. <laughs> We'll go back to the noise situation and peace of mind and being out in a peaceful area. Um, that's one of my concerns. I love being outside. Um, and like the last statement, but we hear dogs all the time. Almost every neighbor probably has a dog. The occasional barking is no big deal. The occasional barking of your dogs currently is no big deal. But you're adding on at least 10 more dogs and they gotta go outside sometime. You're not gonna be able to control them all Earlier you said, you know, just a overnight thing. Now you're talking about when people go on vacation. So you could be having 16 or more dogs in your yard at any given time barking. Um, that's a huge concern uh, and very annoying. And it's not like I'm gonna walk up the driveway, knock on your front door, because now I've completely disturbed my way of life to walk a long driveway. I'm on the shared driveway to your, if you're facing your house, to your right. I see your dogs out there. They haven't been a problem as far as I'm concerned, but I'm the farthest one back. I see them completely, but the traffic issue, that road, <clears throat> yes, it's set for 40 miles an hour, but people crest right, right at your driveway is the crest. If they don't know where they're going, which odds are they won't at least the first half, half dozen times, they're, they're flying over that hill, which goes right to our driveways, and there's accidents. Uh, when I have to check the mail, it's I turn my vehicle off because I need to listen for engines coming. One way it's fine, you can see. The other way you can't see. It's right at their driveway and they pop over that hill like nobody's business. You're adding a lot more traffic just for some dogs. I just, I'm, I'm, I love animals, <laughs> but I'm very upset about this and I'm, and I, I'm sorry, but I'm against it. I, I'd appreciate some consideration on the safety of all the residents up and down that road because now we're increasing the traffic which is already too much and going way too fast um, that's about it okay any any questions of our testimony board members no. very good thank you thank you anyone else mr. black Roger Black, BLACK, 2323 Braddock. And I am retired. My wife is retired. Um, uh, assurances, accountability. Um, you're, the five of you are going to make a decision on the number, if, if approved, on the number of dogs allowed, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, We, we don't, I mean, we have input, but we don't have anything. <clears throat> you know, we, we, we're invested, but a decision's being made. It sounds like at least the existing six plus 10, 16 dogs. And understand that that may only be once or twice, you know, in, in six months at full capacity. But assurances, um, not more than that, or if you have puppies, if you had two litters of puppies, I mean, you, you could have 20, 30 animals at any one time before they're grown and, and sold, given. So just a, a assurances, um, disposal of, you know, dog, uh, there, there's no assurance 
on our part that it's going to be taken care of. The noise, there's no assurance that it's going to be taken care of. There's no, I mean, that there doesn't seem to be much of a plan. And I'm not knocking, you know, Dustin, uh, given the same situation, I, I likely would do the same. Um, but there, there doesn't seem to be, I mean, boundaries, accountability, assurances uh, uh, to, you know, to, to, to hold to, you know, to some sort of standard, some sort of, you know, if, if you understand what I'm saying. Um, there's, well, we could do this, well, you know, they could, we could get a service. There, there's nothing, nothing in, you know, planned to uh, have that done. That, that's a concern. Uh, I, you know, beside the, the noise is, is first and foremost. <clears throat> Therese and I, my wife and I are going to be moving in the next year or two somewhere south so we don't have to deal with the cold winters and selling a house. It's, you know, a major uh, part of our uh, re retirement. Um, noise and multiple, you know, up to 16 dogs is going to be an issue. If I was potentially buying a house, I would not, I'd think, you know, long and hard before buying a house where a kennel was next door. Um, that, that impacts me financially. Um, it may not be a great deal, but it impacts me. And uh, it impacts all, all surrounding neighbors. Um, and, uh, that's about all I have to say. So, thank hey. you. Let me stay there, Mr. Blair. Any questions of his testimony, well, Mr. Major? I Major's? just was going to say, like, um, you know, everything is regulated by the county or the Humane Society for um, any of the issues with the waste management or if the noise is out of control or traffic or anything becomes an issue. You know, it. I feel like it, it is regulated. Um, so that was... That's it. Yeah. Board members, any questions of Mr. Black's testimony? Very good. Anyone else? I think we've exhausted <clears throat> everybody in the audience. Okay. Presentation and of testimony and evidence is now closed and summations are in order. Mr. Moser, would you like to make any summation comments before we deliberate? Thank you for your time. <laughs> Okay, very good. The <coughs> hearing and record of this case is now closed and in accordance with the Open Meetings Act of Maryland, the board will now consider the case. Board members. You always look this way. I look that way this time. I'm supposed to look your way. <laughs> <laughs> Passing the buck. Mr. Caldwell, by default. Oh, boy. Yeah, the, the, the newbie. Um, So we're talking about a, what it seems to me like a large number of dogs, you know, greater than 10, possibly 16 or more with breeding. Uh, the residents in the area have voiced concerns about <coughs> noise from the dogs, uh, traffic noise, waste disposal. Um, still we don't have a clear answer on the uh, distance uh, variance required. Um, also, there's noise from goats. The um, other thing that concerned me <coughs> was the there didn't seem to be any mention of uh, uh, hours uh, that the dogs will be allowed outside. You know, when does it start in the morning? When does it finish in the, uh, the evening? That's undefined. Uh, altogether, I didn't feel there was a very you know clear business plan. It seems like you've kind of backed into this by default without really thinking through all of the ramifications of what you're trying to do in running a business here. I've um, you know I, I'm concerned about the the uh, supervision of the dogs. Um, you mentioned that you said you would guarantee that, that they would be supervised, but one of the residents says. Uh, that the dogs would be noisy and there was no one outside with them. 
So, you know, I'm hmm. not sure what to believe there. And the other thing that concerns me about variances is there's no real um, clear definition of uh, whether this imposes a hardship or not. If there's a way around this by placing the kennel in another location that then eliminates the need for the variance. You have a five acre lot, could it be accommodated by moving the kennel portion and the dog portion 400 feet away? Yeah, but the setback <coughs> is from the property line. line. So that can't be accommodated regardless. Yeah. So does that constitute a hardship? It's a practical difficulty. Yeah, that's practical, practical difficulty. difficulty. Yes. Okay. All right. I've got it, it, gets, it gets tricky in there because of you know, the property line or the curtilage of the home and the size of the lots. And this is the only lot that's under three acres that it's contiguous with. So that's right. why the setback is is required there. I feel concerned for that neighbor because they're right facing the <coughs> front of the noise. So, you know, I'm not really in favor of this uh, at this point. I'm done. Okay. Well, <laughs> second. I think I have a s slightly different perception. Um, I have to say, I was very impressed that the neighbor said, oh, wow, we didn't know you had six dogs. I think six dogs is a lot to not realize that they're on the property. Um, <clears throat> I think it's to be expected that if you have dogs and they're outside, that you're going to hear some barking. I think there's probably, from the testimony I heard, there's pets all over the neighborhood. Having said that, I also feel like 16 dogs is a lot in a residential neighborhood. So I think we should absolutely look at putting a limit on that um, if we are so inclined to grant this. I'm not concerned about the hours of operation. I, my perception was this is not a doggy daycare where people are dropping off in the morning, picking up at night. My perception was that clients <clears throat> existing clients for another occupation will say hey you know we're headed out of town this week are you available so it won't be I'm not I'm not envisioning a high volume kind of boarding facility if you will um, <clears throat> the disposal of the of the waste that that doesn't concern me because the humane society is going to dictate that so I feel like there are other mechanisms in place to make sure that all of these things are being followed all of the rules and regulations so i'm i heard a lot of testimony about traffic <clears throat> and that's you know recognizing that there, this may well this will bring more traffic to braddock road and i understand that people cut through there to go from 27 to woodbine road not to give testimony, but it's been my experience that that has been happening for at least 40 years. 50. Well, I, I'm not that old, but <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to speak to that. So I don't, I don't feel like that's, you know, Mr. Moser's responsibility to police who's driving on Woodbine Road. Um, it's just not practical. In my opinion, it's just not practical to expect that from him. So... Um, recognizing the noise could be an issue again that that I fall back to I think we should limit the number of dogs if we're inclined to grant this there should be an absolute limit on the number of dogs and I don't know that 16 is the number I think that for me that's a bit excessive <clears throat> let me pick up from where you are uh, I neglected to ask you a question uh, mr. chair may I ask uh, no, well, testimony's closed, sorry. Uh, I'm, in, I'm inclined to agree with you. 16's too many. Uh, what I would ask is, what can you live with? But you can't. <laughs> Hearing nothing. Um, I'm going to say, you've got six, add another six. And a max of 12 that would be off the top of my head without your input 
uh, but you did not speak to that. Oh, he said it wasn't allowed to answer. Or you did or, in your presentation. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'm not faulting you. Okay. Yeah. I understand. So, so. Uh, Mr. Simmons, do you think I'm? I don't have a concern about the breeding. I don't, based on what Mr. Voigt suggested, I don't think that those dogs get counted. No. My opinion, mm -hmm. until so they have I, canine teeth. Right. <laughs> <clears throat> Does 12 seem like a reasonable six in addition to the six? I, I said 14 because they requested for eight to 10. So I did go to Francis Scott Key High School. Six That's, and eight or 14, is that correct? Uh, Any advance on 14? <laughs> <laughs> so any, anyway, I, I, that, that's, what, that's what I was, that, that, that was what the number that I wrote down on my paper. Um, I, I can I can tell you that uh, people are usually frantic in the morning. They're hyped up on coffee, and they're late for work. And that is that is an issue. That's an existing issue. And if we restrict this to, let's just go at ten, which I know we're going to be less than that. The amount of traffic generated by this is going to be minuscule as compared to the daily traffic. And I'm not saying it's not going to add to it, but the number of vehicles added is going to be minuscule as compared to the people that are cutting across Braddock Road um, to, to, to get to Woodbine and eventually Route 70. I'm, I'm not minimizing that, uh, but at the same time, that's an existing condition that this board can't rectify. As far as the number of dogs, I, I had written down 14. Um, it's rather interesting that we did hear testimony that they didn't realize that Mr. Moser had six dogs existing uh, over there. So it sounds to me like he has done, um, he's, he's actually conditioned his dogs not to be as vocal as what some dogs can be. Uh, I do have a little bit of a concern because these won't be his own dogs, but Dogs become a product of what they can get away with with their owners. So maybe these dogs will go home better behaved than when they came to him. That's what I'm hoping, Mr. Moser. So I'm, I'm not opposed to this. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little torn. Um, but because this is a five-acre property and not a two- or three-acre property, um, I, I, think, I think that does help out. So I'm, I'm in support, but again, uh, I think we do need to limit the number of dogs. Can we put a limit on the the time they're outside? I don't. <clears throat> Speculation, and we can't ask at this point. But I would assume, um, as a hairdresser, hours are probably. I not. work three days a week, so um, he's home the other days of the week that I'm not. So someone's always. At home. That's testimony, but oh, oh. <laughs> I didn't know how to answer. I didn't hear anything. <laughs> I didn't <laughs> but I mean, I don't. I mean, I. So you're 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 saying restriction as far as like nine o'clock at night to six in the morning? Is that what you're I'm suggesting? Something like that. Maybe not as you know, not seven in the morning, eight to seven or something like that. But but then what happens? And I don't know this answer. What happens to the six that are already there that are you. pets? I'm um, at Mr. Mr. Roy. Oh, you, no, you Mr. Can't, Boyd. That's testimony. It all blurs together. It's a number of dogs. Yeah. I mean, in my mind, I don't want somebody to say if my pet needs to go out at midnight that I can't take him out. Mm hmm. Well, I, I think the, the other thing that was testified to is that the dogs are not going to be left outside unattended. And, and that, that's a key point for me as I go back and listen, as I replay the testimony in my own mind. Um, and with that, with that being testified to, I think that mitigates some of the issues, the noise concern issues that, that were raised. Um, 
but I, again, I understand, uh, Mr. Caldwell understand the, the limiting um, the time that they're outside, and but at the same time, if it's a personal pet, um, you know, who's to say that they couldn't be well, out there? If, if they're going to guarantee there's a, someone out with the dogs, dog or dogs, then I can back off on that. I, and, and and we've we've placed restrictions before as far as you know the hours that the dogs can be out with these with these but um it's been it, it was testified to that they would not be left out unattended so you wouldn't have six or eight dogs out there running at midnight <coughs> more discussion board members ideas Part of me wants to say that <clears throat> if they sell the property, this is gone. Yes. Yeah. We, we can put that in as a condition. I agree with that. Or I didn't hear that statement. If, if the property is sold, um, the, then a, a new ownership couldn't uh, walk right into a kennel with however many dogs and whatever hours we we say so it stays with the present ownership we're down to the question of the number of dogs and I'm the chairman I can't make the motion go on Richard uh, I think 16 is a concern I would be inclined to to say that's too many I'm not going to agree yeah, to 16 I'm not agree to 16 I won't either <laughs> all right I don't think I don't think any of the rest of us will agree to 16 right so either so 12 uh, something 14 or less I agree with that 14 or less oh I mean that was just your my suggestion to whether mm. you wanted to say 12 mm. or 13 or all right I can agree to 14 or less <clears throat> no more than 14 at any time you comfortable with that I'm I'm comfortable. That's the number I wrote down on my paper. Fourteen. Uh, Still think that's high. I think it's high. I, I think it's high. Yeah, I do. Twelve. Well, you want to go to twelve? I'd say twelve. Okay. Well. Okay. <laughs> Any other discussion? So twelve, and it's only during the ownership. During the, the, during Mr. Mr. Moser's ownership. Yeah, I didn't even ask. I'm assuming you do own the property. <laughs> and I know that was testimony. I didn't ask. Well, you're breaking didn't all the rules here today. I broke every rule today. All the times. Uh, sorry. Okay, someone want to make a motion? I'll make one if you want. In the matter of case number 6401 before the Board of Zoning Appeals, the board uh, grants the conditional uh, use request for a commercial uh, kennel for not more than 12 dogs and also allows for the distance variances. I'll second that. Oh, it needs to have With uh, the caveat that the conditional use request is not transferable uh, on the sale of the property. Yep. Second. Does that meet legal sufficiency, Mr. Dixon? I think so. Okay, very good. Any further discussion on the motion? Okay, all those in favor, aye. 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 All opposed, no. Motion carries. Our oral decision will become final upon a written decision which will be issued within 30 days unless otherwise extended by this board. The board's decision may be appealed by filing a petition for judicial review with the clerk of the Circuit Court of Carroll County in accordance with the provisions of Chapter 200, Title 7 of the Maryland Rules of Procedure. The appeal must be filed within 30 days of the date of the board's written decision. Thank you very much, and this hearing is adjourned.
We'll go ahead and call the BZA um, to order. And in front of us here this afternoon is a continuation of case number 6355. The file has already been introduced. Um, gentlemen, could you refresh my memory as to exactly where we were at in the process? I think. Well, I can share that I, I just looked at the tape. And Mr. Leahy wanted to introduce, well, it's already introduced Exhibit 10, wanted to, the board to see some highlighted parts of Exhibit 10, and then there was talk about Mr. Martin being a witness. That's, those are the last things that happened. You turned it off. That's You're on. Now I'm on. Um, I th I watched I tried to watch it over the weekend and it the tolerance on that I couldn't move it around well but I did see parts I thought Mr Martin was was subject to a little bit of cross exam or a little bit of examination by Mr Leahy do you that, remember that's, that's yeah. what I, I I called him as an adverse witness in my case in chief okay did you finish with him no I don't remember Mr Martin being called the last witness I have is Mr Jordan. No, he was definitely called uh, uh, Mr. Dixon because I watched a little bit of it on that video. But, 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 but Mr. Leahy called him as the witness. Is yes. That correct. Yes. And then I think Mr. Stein's was called after Mr. Uh, I believe that's right. Mr. 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 Stein's and then Mike Jordan was the last witness. So are you? Are you? So Mr. Leahy. So I guess what that leaves is Mr. Leahy is still on his case. Yes. You you haven't started yet. Okay. And uh, Mr. Stines, who's not here yet, but it's going to be here momentarily, will, will you continue with him, or is your intent to continue with him, or call him again, or? I'm going to pray call him in rebuttal. I want to hear your case first. So, okay. You know, he's okay. already testified. It, okay. It, it, so are you finished? Um, yeah, that's, that's the question, because <clears throat> you, you called Mr. Martin. I stumped Mr. Leahy. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to introduce one more exhibit. This is an email string from Jordan to Scott Robertson, who of course is a zoning officer. No, no objection, but I will note that this should already be in the record as part of the zoning investigation file, sure which was, why. yeah. Why but is, okay. but it, it may be, but is that in our file? It may be in the zoning. No, because it, it is in your file because you okay. adopted uh, the zoning investigation file as part of the record at the very beginning of this case. Okay. okay. This will be 13. 13. And you want to enter that into evidence at this point, Mr. Leahy? Um, I do, but I want to give copies to each board members. And um, thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thank you. Which number exhibit will this be? Thirteen. There was some cross-examination and some argument by Mr. Schaefer on behalf of the Martins that um, the Jordans received information about when the zoning administrator had declared that what had been a sea container over a nine-month year period had suddenly been converted, not suddenly, had been converted to a trailer. And I just wanted to make it clear that uh, this email from Scott Robertson dated May 26 back to Mrs. Jordan in response to her May 24th email uh, is where he notified them that it had been converted to a legally licensed certified roadworthy trailer. Um, and of course, that actually happened April 19th. So by the time they were notified, it was already more than 30 days past when the action had happened. So I'd like to introduce this into evidence for that purpose. 
Okay, and we will accept that into evidence. Thank you. And um, with that, I, I would rest my case. Okay, Mr. Schaefer. Thank you. I call Dwayne uh, Dwayne Martin. May he testify from here? Uh, hey, bef let's just for let, let's just make some some. Uh, anyone is going to testify here today, whether you testified in the previous hearing or not, which was a little while ago. Could you please stand and raise your right hand and take the oath? So if you plan on testifying, okay, do you swear or affirm under the penalties of perjury that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Very good. You can be seated. Okay. Mr. Martin, will you state your uh, name and uh, address for the record, please? Wayne Martin, 3904 Grave Run Road, Millers, Maryland. Mr. Martin, just uh, as a preliminary matter, did you, uh, uh, since the last hearing, did you have a conversation with uh, your neighbors, Ron and Angie Mercado, regarding this matter? Yes. And did you obtain a letter from them? Yes. I'd like to... That's being, that's being marked as Exhibit 1 for identification. Mr. Uh, uh, Martin, did, did that letter, does that letter uh, indicate support uh, for your, uh, for the trailer slash container located on your property? Yes, it seems to. And it, okay. I, I'd like to offer that in as my Exhibit Number 1. No we'll objection. We'll, we'll accept that. Okay. Thank you. Now, Mr. Martin, uh, did there come a time within the last couple of years when you uh, uh, s decided to uh, put uh, locate a container of some sort on your property in order to provide storage for uh, certain personal uses? Yes, it started around the end of 2019. Okay. And before you uh, uh, locate purchased and located uh, the container slash trailer on your property, did you contact any of your neighbors? Yes. Can you describe uh, those contacts, who you contacted and the nature of those, co those, uh, those discussions? Uh, I spoke with Miss Farrell, who's uh, sitting over here to my left, and I spoke with Ashley Hanahan, I believe. I don't know that I spoke with Chuck directly. Um, okay, who's Chuck? Chuck. Chuck Galata. He's the neighbor on the other side. Okay. Um, Ashley Hanahan. Yes, and Ashley is, is his wife. And I spoke with both of them, and I told them of my intentions, and I wanted to make sure that it wasn't uh, you know, going to be a problem with them. And at that time, uh, there was no, uh, they indicated that, that uh, there was no problem with it and thought it was a good idea. Okay. Now, did you talk to um, Miss, and that's Miss Farrell. Yes. Is that right? Miss Farrell. Farrell? Farrell. Miss Farrell. You talked to Miss Farrell personally, right? Correct. Uh, describe the circumstances. Did you walk down to her property? Yes, I walked down to her house. Okay. And what did you? What was the nature of that conversation? Uh, I just explained to her what uh, what were we what we were looking at doing, and uh, in the process, I offered to uh, fill in a big mud hole she had in, in uh, consideration for her allowing me the option of using her driveway to have the uh, storage container delivered. So you described to her the fact that you wanted to locate a container of some sort on, the, on your property for storage purposes, correct? Correct. And uh, did you, at that point, you had not purchased or acquired the trailer, correct? Correct. Did you describe generally what, what it was like? Yes. Okay. And did you talk with her about how you would get it on your, uh, on your property? Yes. Describe those, what, what did you talk about? Well, I told her that um, I, I would... She would offer me the option of using her driveway in case the weather wasn't uh, good to bring it down through my yard. Um, you know, her driveway is an established driveway. It's been there for uh, 20, 25 years or something, and it wouldn't tear that up like it would have torn up my yard. 
and um, and I and, and in exchange for that, I offered, like I said, I offered to fill, fill her. Uh, she had a big mud hole there. It was about I don't know, 30 feet long, 15, 20 feet wide, um, that uh, filled up with water very frequently. And I offered to have my guy, you know, put some of the the material into that uh, to fill that up so that it wouldn't be a mud hole anymore. Okay. Did did uh, Miss Farrell uh, indicate uh, assent to that? Was she okay with that? Yeah, she was excited to have it filled. Okay, and was she okay with you locating the trailer on your property? At that time, yes. And then did you later locate the trailer on your property? Yes. Did you later uh, have your uh, guy or fill in the, uh, the mud hole with millings or something like that? Well, he did that before the trailer was located. Okay. Uh, and you also che checked with Ashley, uh, you said... Uh, Aunt Hannah Hannah. Hannah Hannah, and that's the other neighbor, or one of your other neighbors. And what was that conversation about? Similar? Yeah, very similar. She said that was a good idea. Uh, you know, she knows those people that have uh, have those for storing hay in for their animals and stuff. And okay. Did you spend money to have that that uh, hole fixed on the uh, um, uh, feral driveway? I did. About how much? About nine hundred dollars. And then in March or April 2020, you actually acquired this, the uh, sea container slash trailer. I'm, I'm trying to not characterize it we all know what it is and maybe the definition of it may be your determination at some point but we all know what we're talking about the sea the sea container size trailer that's there now correct you put that on there in in, in eight, March April 2020 correct yes all right now uh, shortly thereafter on or about July of 2020 you got some kind of contact from the zoning office indicating that uh, it was being investigated, correct? That's correct. All right. And subsequent to July of 2020 and up to, I don't know, if, uh, well, I guess uh, up to on or about the date of Mr. Uh, the, the, the email put on May 26, 2021, um, you dealt with pretty regularly with Carroll County Zoning Office regarding the trailer, correct? That's correct. All right. And you knew that uh, Ms. Farrell and the Mr. and Mrs. Jordan uh, were also uh, interested in dealing with the Carroll County uh, Zoning Office about that trailer, correct? That is incorrect. Oh, you didn't know, know that? I don't know that Ms. Farrell was involved at that point. She okay. didn't get involved until the end of June or end of May, beginning of June. Okay, but you knew that the Jordans were uh, uh, upset and, and uh, were contacting the Carroll County uh, Zoning Office and the County Commissioners, correct? That's correct. All right. And you, during that time period, did you attempt to make the trailer legal under zoning? Yes. All right. And did you review the zoning laws yourself and read them? Yes, all of them. Okay, tried to read as many as you could, right? 158 pages worth. Okay, and did you also uh, have continuing discussions with the zoning office of Carroll County? Yes. And that's Jay Voigt and Scott Robinson? Yes. All right, and did those discussions involve what would make the trailer legal and what made it illegal, quote, end quote, under zoning? Yes. All right. And did you try to take actions to legalize your trailer? I did. What did you do? Uh, I remade it into a trailer. Okay. And we'll, we'll describe generally what you did to remake it into a trailer. Uh, put axles and uh, supports on it, a tongue, lights, um, itch, uh, brakes on the axles. Did you all, did, and, and at some point in time, did you also apply for a, uh, a, a trailer license from the state of Maine? Yes. Did you do that in good faith, um, thinking that it was uh, uh, a way to make your trailer legal? Yes. What do you use the trailer for? Storage. What, what kind of storage? Uh, you mean what's in there? Yeah. Well, I got some Boy Scout stuff. On and garden tools, uh, some gardening implements for my daughter. Those are commercial, personal use things, right? Yeah. Yep. 
what is your do you are you semi-retired or I don't what are what would you call yourself <laughs> I drive a school bus okay so you uh, you drive a school so you, okay so you don't use this trailer in connection with any commercial enterprise or business correct correct um, Has the trailer been actively used by you for storage and personal use uh, during all this time? Yes. Now, could you take this trailer off your property if you hooked uh, a vehicle up to it and drove it off your property? I could. Okay. You, you, ha have you done so in the last, uh, since, you, since it was on there? No. All right. And could you take it off your property without using Mrs. Farrell's driveway? Absolutely. And have you, do you have an RV vehicle? I do. Do you take that on and off your property? I do. Right. Now, why did you then need to ask, or why did you ask Mrs. Farrell if you could use your driveway to get it on there? Uh, as I stated earlier, because of the conditions of the ground, um, you know, the time of year it was going to be coming, and a lot of times it gets muddy, and, um, uh, and, and frankly, partly impassable uh, right. due to the, the freezing and the thawing and the top layer being muddy and the bottom part being frozen and and I just wanted to use that as an option. But your property fronts on uh, Grave Run Road, does it not? Yes. And has you know significant amount of frontage, correct? Correct. And you have a driveway that that comes off of Grave Run Road, correct? Yes. And that driveway would be uh, acceptable to uh, accommodate moving the trailer off, correct? Yes, I move my uh, RV on and off of there fairly frequently. Is the trailer located within 15 foot of a public road? No. Okay. Does it block anybody's sight distance uh, from a public road, if any neighbors, if they're trying to make a turn or anything? No. What's the weight of the trailer? Uh, 9,990 pounds. Now, do you know that because you weighed it? No. How do you know that? Uh, that's the maximum gross vehicle weight. You, was that, was that uh, printed on the trailer on a tag that was there when you bought the trailer? Uh, it's on there now. I don't know that it was on there when I bought it. Did you put it on there? I did. Okay. How'd you get it? I'll get what? The tag? Yeah. Uh, just little stickers. Now, how did you know that was the weight? Well, because it has to be under 10,000 pounds to uh, not be considered a commercial vehicle. Bear, bear with me one second, please. Now, at some point in time, uh, you received uh, uh, notice from the zoning office that uh, you the trailer was legal under Carroll County zoning laws. Correct. Correct. Right, and and. You, I'm going to show you Exhibit 13, uh, the, uh, uh, I don't know, appellants, Miss Farrell's Exhibit 13. Um, that, that's an email dated May 26, 2021, from Scott Robinson of, zone, of the Zoning Office to Patricia and Mike. That's Mr. and Mrs. Jordan, correct? Yes, I don't believe. And what's that say? This email here? Yeah. Good morning, Mr. Jordan. Mr. Martin converted the trailer to a legally licensed and certified roadworthy trailer. He is allowed to have a legally licensed trailer on his property. I have closed the case. Thanks, Scott. Now, are you aware that um, uh, subsequent to that, e that email that uh, Commissioner Stephen Wance uh, either was involved or became involved uh, at the behest of <clears throat> Mr. and Mrs. Jordan? Yes, after that email, uh, some e after that date of that email, uh, Mr. Wentz sent out some other emails. None, none ever to me. He sent them to the zoning office, right? And to Mr. and Mrs. Jordan and Ms. Farrell, right? Correct. Okay. And uh, he was inquiring as to how this could happen or why it happened uh, to the zoning office, correct? Yes. Right. And the zoning office replied to him, and uh, he then notified uh, the Mrs. Farrell and Mr. and Mrs. Jordan that the decision had been made, correct? Uh, 
Yeah, I have the email here if you want to read it. Okay, go ahead. Let's see. Let's uh, let's see it. This also is in the record, but we'll point it out specifically. You know, I don't think it's in that pack, is it? It's right here. Okay. Okay, this is uh, an email from Commissioner Wance to Patricia and Mike. Jordan. What's, and the, date? What's the date of that it? That is uh, dated Thursday, June 17th. It is to Patricia and Mike Jordan with a, with a CC to Kathleen Farrell. What's it say? Subject REC shipping container at <laughs> 3904 Grave Run Road, zoning closed case. Michael and Patricia, good morning. I continue to look into all of the aspects of this issue and the code requirements. To date, based on the current code and parameters, I've been advised all aspects and actions are within what the code states. The container is permitted and they have done what has been asked. This case clearly shows there is a need to update our code, especially considering these containers can be, can be acquired much cheaper than building a conventional shed. We are, seeing, we are seeing an uptick in folks who are getting these things and using them for storage. With that said, Common sense tells me much needs to be done moving forward to address this and efforts are underway to bring our code up to speed. I do know there has been an effort made to reach out to your neighbors in the interest of putting up a buffer, which would include possible fencing, landscaping, etc. I have not received any word on how that is moving along. We will keep you informed on that effort. Again, I'm sure this is not the answer you are looking for, but my investigation has found our staff has done the correct work and the decisions made are spot on with the current parameters at set, as set forth by our codes. Safest regards, Stephen Wance, District 1, Carroll County Board of Commissioners. Take it out there. Uh, I've seen it, I don't have it handy, but. I don't have that extra copy. I do, but I, it would take me 10 minutes to find it. All right, go ahead. There's one on the back of there that's. Yeah, I'd like to offer this as my uh, Exhibit 2. Okay, that's all I have for Mr. Martin at this time. Mr. Leahy, do you have questions of Mr. Martin's <clears throat> testimony? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Martin, uh, I was going to say you were present at the last hearing, but none of us were present. It was a virtual hearing. <laughs> but you participated in it. Yes. And you heard the testimony of Kathleen Farrell at that hearing. Yes. And do you recall her saying that when she gave you permission, she thought it was going to be like a storage shed? I do recall her saying okay. that. And, um, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's, am I on? Yes. Okay. When the, when the red light's on, it says I'm on. Yeah, that's what confused me. Uh, the red light. Uh, the okay. red light up here. Oh, it's up here. Okay. Okay. Well, yours isn't on then. No, his was on. Okay. So you understood from her testimony that she thought it was going to be a storage shed, and when it turned out to be this sea coastal container, she was upset. That's what. That was her testimony. Yes. Okay. And that's not at odds with the conversation you had with her, is it? Yes, it is. Okay, how's it at odds with the conversation you had with her? I told her I was looking to get a shipping container, but not, not a storage shed. Okay, you said it was going to be a shipping container. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Now, um, bear with me a minute. Um, These are from the file, but I need, I want to refer to them separately. They're, they're two different. From the zoning administrator yep. file? Okay. From the zoning administration file. Okay. So if you want to grab one of each. Okay. Do 
we do that one 14. Okay. Is it number already? Yeah. It's two sides of the same. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. 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 Start your 228. If you would do this 15. 25. Oh, okay. Stop it. It's no, I think that's because it's got this color. Oh, I keep it. I don't charge much. I hope not, because uh, oh, I do have other pens. It's, it's one page, okay, but there's multiple copies. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, it's only a one page exhibit. I just wanted the board to be able to have the benefit of looking at it. Okay, so this is maybe the original 14. Oh, I see. The original is the last page. And here's Thank you. this one. Thank you. Or you want to get back? Yeah, I wanted to. I wanted to give all the other members a fifteen. That you maybe gave them all to Mr. Simmons. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. All right. Fifteen. Take a look at those for me, real quick. Can you is is fourteen the one that has this in in black and part of it? Yes. That's, that's why we have fifteen. Yeah, that's fourteen. Fourteen has the. Gotcha. Thing in front of it. Fifteen doesn't. Gotcha. And the and the purpose of that is to provide together a a full picture of the main uh, license situation. Correct. Correct. Okay. Gotcha. Mr. Martin, this is this is the. First of all, what is what is Exhibit 14? What does that show? Well, it says it's the top state of Maine long-term semi-trailer registration. So this is the registration in Maine for this particular trailer. Correct. And 15 is a registration as well. Yes, it's just another part of it. Just that another picture. part. Um, and what is the VIN number for this, which I think it shows best on 14? Uh, the vehicle identification number is 19800039968. Okay, where did you get that VIN number? How did you come up with that VIN number? Uh, it was engraved on the side of the uh, on the side of the trailer. Okay, so that that VIN number was on the trailer. Yes, when I bought it. When you bought it, okay. Um, Did the state of Maryland ever issue a VIN number for your trailer? I do not know. I did not see anything on there. Did you um, take the, this trailer that you had put together, did you take it any place to be inspected in the state of Maryland? I did not. Did you have anybody come in and inspect the trailer for you? No, sir. Okay. Um, would you agree with me that this is a homemade trailer? Uh, yes. Okay. And when you went through to apply, went through with the state of Maine to, I'm sorry. When you went to the state of Maine to get this uh, trailer license, um, were you aware of the requirements in Maine for homemade trailers? I was made aware of what, requir what requirements I needed from the uh, tag agency that I, that I went through. Where was the tag agency? In Maine. Okay. So you went through a tag agency in Maine? Correct. And they, what did they tell you about the requirements for a homemade trailer? Uh, they sent me a packet of information that I needed to fill out. Do you have the information with you now? I do not. I had to send it back to them. Okay. So going back to the homemade trailer, they did not tell you that a homemade trailer had to have a VIN number of at least 17 digits? They did. They told me that that was uh, uh, legislation that went in after this trailer was actually manufactured. But, it was in, but that was in existence at the time you went to license the trailer, correct? That's correct. They didn't, they didn't think that was an issue? Apparently not. They didn't say anything to me. Did they tell you that the homemade trailer had to be issued a state of Maryland VIN? They did not. Did they tell you it had to be inspected in the state of Maryland? They did not.
I can add that they did tell me that it would need a state of Maryland VIN if it did not already have a VIN on it. Now, I think you did testify that this trailer's been there. Well, it became a trailer apparently in April 2021, so some 14 months ago. It has never been moved as a trailer, has it? That's correct. What vehicle would you use to move it? A tractor or a truck or whatever? Well, I think as I testified last time, I have two that, that would be capable. I have a F-250 a Ford truck with a diesel engine, and I have mm -hmm. a uh, Suburban with a diesel engine as well. Do you know what they're rated for in terms of um, hauling ability or how much weight they're rated to be able to pull? I think we went through this last time. The towing capacity of the truck is uh, around 15,000 or so, and I'm not sure what it is on the Suburban. You mentioned that the, uh, the trailer is um, <coughs> 9,900 pounds. That's the maximum gross vehicle weight, yes. When you say that's a maximum, maximum gross vehicle rate, what do you mean? That's the maximum it can weigh when you hit the roads in the state of Maryland. Do you know what this, do you know what this trailer weighs now, empty? I do not. So you're saying that you could load it up until it got to be 9,900 pounds and you believe it would then be legal on the road? Yes. Did anyone advise you when you were converting this to a trailer? Did you receive any advice from anybody uh, knowledgeable about trailers, about how to convert it? Uh, just some stuff on the internet and YouTube. Okay, so you looked on the internet and YouTube and then you, you made the determination to fix it up as a trailer as we've seen in the pictures. Correct. I don't have any further questions of Mr. Martin. No, no, uh, no redirect. Uh, Does anyone in the audience have any questions of Mr. Martin's testimony? <clears throat> Board members. The other two have said no. Okay. That concludes our presentation. Okay. Wow. We have some rebuttal. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. So, re rebuttal witnesses then? Oh. Yes. Okay, very good, Mr. Lee. Mr. Stoms, would you, do you want him to testify from here? I would prefer that, to be yeah. able to see okay, him. Okay, why don't you yeah. go there yeah. so people. No problem. So, so we don't keep changing microphones. You can sit right there. Right here. Mm -hmm. okay. Wait a minute, <laughs> Mr. Stoms, you, you were not here when we um, swore in witnesses, so I, I'm going to ask you to stand and please oh, raise okay. your right hand. Okay, no problem. Do you swear or affirm under the penalties of perjury that the testimony you were about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Very good. You can have a seat. Mr. Stoms, you testified at the previous virtual hearing on January I think it was January 25th, 2022. Yes, it was. Thank you. Could we get his full name again, please? Sure. Mr. Lewis, Lewis Amstoms, Jr. And how do you spell your last name? S-T-O-M-S. 
M as in Mary? S T O M S. M as in Mary. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, as I started to say, you testified at the last virtual hearing, and at that time the board accepted you as an expert witness with regard to commercial trailers. Correct. Okay. Did you look further into the procedure for registering the trailer in Maine? Yes, I've, I've known the procedure for a long time, but I did do look further into it at that time, yes. I'd like to object um, to this, in what I believe will be this entire line of testimony, um, which it sounds to me as if, based on the cross-examination of Mr. Martin and now the opening question to Mr. Stoms, that Mr. Leahy would like to uh, litigate uh, the issue of the main license before this board. Uh, I am not aware that the board, in fact I submit, that the board does not have jurisdiction, nor does it want jurisdiction, to hear evidence regarding the validity or non-validity of a main license tag and decide up or down on that validity. It's not in your expertise. It's not in your powers. You have the power to decide variances. You have the power to decide uh, administrative decisions made by county officials. You don't have the, the authority nor the expertise, uh, nor should to decide the validity of the main license. There is a main license. It's on the, if Mr. Leahy or Ms. Farrell or Mr. and Mrs. Jordan would like to challenge that, I suspect they could find out a way to do that through the Maryland Department of Transportation or the Maine Department of Transportation, uh, not through this board. I'd like to be heard. The whole, yeah, absolutely. The, the whole issue which was uh, testified to at length at the first hearing, is that this trailer is not legal. It does not meet safety standards. It cannot be driven across the roads of the state of Maryland. It's not properly, and, and as part of that, we will show that it's not properly licensed under Maryland. This is only going to take five, seven minutes. There's not a lot to it but it's information this board should be aware of in making its overall determination whether this is a commercial trailer under the purposes of the Carroll County Zoning Code. And that, which we've talked about a little before, and, and that's part of our argument in the appeal, is the reason it's not a commercial trailer is a commercial trailer has to be something that's usable as a trailer. It just can't sit on there with like a pig with lipstick. I mean, it's got wheels and it's got a stiff hitch and it's not moving anywhere and it's never moved anywhere. So I think the board should hear this testimony from who's been recognized as an expert. Both of you have made valid um, comments here concerning this case, but um, we'll, we'll see where the questioning goes at this point and we'll go ahead and allow the questioning. Up to 16? Yes, yeah, 16. <clears throat> All these 16? Or you, you no, they're just, it's a two-page exhibit. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's a two-page exhibit. Okay. So. Just keeping track of it. Let's see, there's about five times three is 15 uses. 15 dollars. I've got some more exhibits. <laughs> Showing you what we have just uh, marked as Exhibit 16 for the board, 
and ask if you could uh, identify what Exhibit 16 is. Well, it's how to register your trailer in the state of Maine, and it basically covers if I want to take a commercial trailer and register it in the state of Maine that I need to send them a 17-digit serial number, which is assigned by the manufacturer, certifying that it is uh, made commercially viable for the road. And it also states down there on item four, if your trailer's homemade um, or your bin number is less than 17 digits, it will require a different form. And it also uh, requires a state assigned serial number. And uh, in the um, you know, state of Maine to register a homemade trailer. And, uh, you know, that's in the state of Maryland, if you go to register a homemade trailer, you have to get a state assigned serial number to it, which requires taking the trailer down to Glen Burnie and getting that state assigned. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'd like to renew my objection. This just confirms to me that we are being led down the rabbit hole of a whole strain of testimony as to which focuses on the issue of whether or not this vehicle is properly registered in the state of Maine. Now, I'm not prepared, frankly, to litigate that issue here today. If I knew that were the issue, if I were going to a DOT hearing, I would have called the agency that he used in Maine, maybe, and I would have gotten information. Um, uh, in fact, you heard Mr. Martin testify that they told him that, the that this, some of this stuff in here, for instance, the n length of the VIN number, didn't apply because the legislature didn't apply. Are you prepared to decide the issue of whether or not that's proper or not based on the testimony here today? I'm not prepared to defend it. Mr. Martin should not need to defend it. The fact of the matter is Mr. Martin, and, and, and by the way, this was never brought up to Jay Voigt. This was never brought up to Jay Voigt when he said this is a licensed vehicle. Um, and you're here, we're here on Mr. Lay's appeal of Mr. Voigt's decision. Now, how do we, well, and, 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 and on top of that, it's gonna take a lot of time. And, and it's not relevant. I understand what you're saying, Mr. Schaefer, but um I would hope that the the board can distinguish what facts we need to do we need to uh, uh, listen to in making our determination uh, in, in the case here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna allow them to go forward. And Mr. Leahy again, um, Mr. Schaefer makes some valid points here. And what does this have to do with the appeal of the zoning administrator's decision? Well, it, again, of course, it goes to the whole heart of the matter, which this is not a viable commercial trailer that's roadworthy. Now, his testimony at the last hearing was very clear about all that, and, and um, it's been basically never contradicted. This is just adding the fact that what one has to do to get it done. Now, this, this goes to the issue of whether or not this is a viable trailer because it's not properly registered. He's already put on all his evidence of why it's not a viable trailer. Mr. Stans has testified the last time about roadworthiness and the brakes and the this and the that. In fact, well, and I'll, in my close, that's all in the record. This clearly is, to, is attempt, an attempt to prove this is not properly registered, therefore it's not a, 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 a legal vehicle. And that, that information can be considered by the board in its discretion. And they can weigh, they, they've heard, uh, uh, Mr. Martin testified that he went through some agency and they told him over the phone that everything was kosher. I think it's fine that the board understands how one goes through to register a trailer in Maine and this expert is simply doing that. And we're about finished anyway on it. We're, so. We'll go ahead and allow. Miss Martin, it's... No, 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 wait. Mr. S Mr. Stom is the witness at, at this point and unless you're called... Um, I have a question. Okay, but, but we'll have to wait on that. Okay, Mr. Leahy, you can, you can continue. So, um, Mr. Stoms, for Mr. Martin to have gotten the Maryland-issued VIN, he would have to have that taken to Glen Burnie and, and inspected. Yeah, it would have to be inspected and a state assigned serial number to it. And 
and I'm as I have never done that in the state of Maine. Asked the state of Maine to assign a serial number, but I would assume the state of Maine is the same because normally <coughs> when a state, any state, is assigning a serial number to a unit, they're going to personally inspect it themselves, verify that you acquired all the components together uh, correctly, and you know it's not something stolen that you're trying to re-sign a number to. So that's why they require you to take it to some form of a state agency to have it inspected and, and here in Maryland it happens to be down in Glen Burnie. I don't have any further questions in Mr. Stott. No, no questions. Thank you. Um, board members, questions? I have a question. <clears throat> so I'm reading number four on how to register your trailer. Okay. And it, it references if your trailer is a homemade trailer or is your VIN number less than 17 digits. And then it, it says all of these steps that you need to go through, which is what I think Mr. Stoms just enumerated to us. <clears throat> Can you help me understand how I'm looking clearly at a state of Maine registration that has a 10 digit VIN number if it's not allowed? Why would they have issued that? I, well, if I can interject some of my own personal opinion in the state of Maine, you can send the state of Maine almost anything you want for a trailer, and they will register it as long as you pay for the tags, and they'll send them to you. And we have done that in the past. Uh, all the ones that we've sent up there are 17-digit serial number because they were manufactured trailer, and I've registered several trailers with my companies over the years in the state of Maine. It's a simple process and send them the money, and they send you back the title and send you a tag. But, and, uh, but this is in fact a legal registration is what you're saying. Regardless of their process, regardless of what you perceive as, yeah. you know, it's, it's easy just to, to send the money. It, I mean, this obviously. There is, there's no determination. When you register a trailer <laughs> in the state of Maine, I can take a trailer that's on my yard that has 17 digit number that can have tires and brakes and everything that would never pass DOT send the information to Maine, and I can have a tag inside of a week. Legally? Yeah, legally from that point of view, but it's, uh, it's not roadworthy, and, uh, you know, you're kind of just, I don't know, to me you're just covering something up, is what you're doing with it. But that, that's my own personal opinion. I'm sorry if I'm outside of what I'm supposed to do, but, the, uh, uh, you know, when you make a homemade trailer, the agencies are usually wanting you to certify that it's roadworthy. And, and when you sign the title work to go to Maine, uh, if you read all the fine print, you're definitely certifying that something's roadworthy and, you know, going to be inspected. Uh, but there's nobody that comes and inspects it and checks for you. Okay. Any other questions on Mr. Stom's testimony? Okay. Very good. Mr. Leahy. Any more rebuttal witnesses? I do. Um, Kathleen Farrell, would you? It's Farrell. Farrell, I know. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody's <laughs> listening. I'm so bad on names anyway, to be honest. Huh. You want me to sit over here? Yes, please. I'd like to object. And the reason is I, I have... I've heard no reason why this this is new evidence. Maybe it is. Uh, maybe there's a proffer that there's new evidence here. We'll be looking at new evidence. <laughs> okay. What's this? I'd like to object to the new evidence. I, don't, I haven't seen it yet, so. I don't want to hear Mr. So, Leahy's response to your objection. Right. This is this is a recent picture, and and uh, showing what's out there now. So objection. This is clearly designed to prejudice the board by attempting to show that Mr. Martin's yard is sloppy. Okay. It has nothing to do with whether or not Mr. Voigt's decision that the trailer is legal is is right or wrong and that's what we're here for well, and why this is relevant is that again the argument we've made already and we're going to continue to make 
is that under the Carroll County Zoning Code, a commercial trailer has to be a trailer being used for its purpose by the homeowner. And this is a trailer, a commercial trailer is something you take on the road and move things with. You don't just stick tires on something never, in, never intending to move it and put it on your property and call it a trailer. I would just like to say that Mr. and Mrs. Martin and I purposely decided at the very beginning of this case not to take photographs of Mrs. Farrell's property and show them to you because, and I'll proffer to you that it that, that wasn't pretty, because I advised Mr. Martin that that's not relevant to whether or not Mrs. Farrell could make a complaint about this trailer. So I, I stand on my objection. I understand. Uh, and we're going to allow this into evidence, and we'll see where Mr. Leahy goes with this. Okay, you guys, just so we're clear. The one where that you can see the full school bus is 17, and the one that you can just see a part of the school bus is 18. Okay, well, I didn't get the I didn't get 17. I mismarked my copy. I got this is 18. Yes. I got that's what I have, and I'm told that's 18. I apologize. Okay. But there's another there must one. Must be some extra 17s up here, showing the full school boxes. I've got 17 and 18, Mr. Leahy. I've got. I just made mine 18. I'll surrender my copies if they <coughs> you have to cancel. It's fine. Which one are you missing? I'm in the full the full uh, photo. 17. I'm showing what's been marked as exhibit 18, which shows just a part of the school bus. Who took that picture? I did. How long ago was it taken? Um, a few days ago. Okay. And um, that, that number 18 shows the um, the trailer in question right mm -hmm. now okay. has that trailer been moved since it was licensed as a trailer in april of 2021 objection asked and answered during the last hearing we'll allow it, it was it was it another was, five months have passed of which it okay. hasn't been moved. okay it's it's because of the lift uh, it up once to go on blocks but other than that it has never moved could you identify the witness, please? Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Farrell. Could you please identify yourself Kathleen for the record? Farrell. Kathleen Farrell. You want to give your address? Yeah, I, I address. Oh, sure. 3908 Grave Run Road, Millers, okay. Maryland. Okay. okay. I would move these evidence, 17 and 18, into evidence. Uh, 17 was also a picture taken by you in the last few days. Right. Mm -hmm. I would move them into evidence. Objection for the record. Okay, for the record, this this objected to, but we're going to allow those in. Okay. You, you heard Mr. Martin testify um, during his examination that he okay. contacted you right. about bringing this you have it over onto, your, onto his property. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes. Mm -hmm. did, did he tell you it was a sea container? No, that's not my recollection of it. He tell you it was a storage container. That, that's my under, was my understanding. Of it. You you understood it to be like a storage unit. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's why you gave him permission to come. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. I have nothing further. Miss Farrell, is it possible you misunderstood? Well, you know, this is how how long ago. My recollection is that he called it a, that it was a store a storage container, not that it was a. a a sea container. A okay, sea what's a, what is your storage, a, a storage shed? That was that's my recollection. A storage shed. You mean like something you would buy at uh, Home Depot or something like that? That type of thing, yes. Yeah, and um, if if that were the case, did you wonder why he would need special permission to come down your driveway for that? No, I didn't wonder about it. And you had no objection to him doing, uh, doing a storage shed? 
No, I don't. I don't have a problem with the storage shed. I think that fits into the area. Did you do you, you recall that the, the conversation was on your front porch, wasn't it? Actually, I think it was in my driveway down near his house. Okay, and uh, and uh, did you question him about uh, the, the 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 identity of what he was wanted to put on there? No, we, we, we talked about it for a few minutes. We probably had a five-minute conversation. Yeah. I mean, you didn't say, is it going to have a roof? Is it going to uh, have two doors? Is it going to have any windows? You didn't, you didn't ask that, nor did he tell you that, right? No, because it didn't cross my mind that it would be something different from a storage shed. Okay. When you saw it, you didn't like it, right, what he put up there? No. Okay. And you drive down your driveway, and that's when you can see it, right? Yes. But then once you get over the over the hill, so to speak, and go down to your house. You can't see it anymore, can you? Not, from, not once I'm inside my house. If I'm out on the property, I can see it. Yeah, you can walk up to the top of your property and see it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. No further questions. No further questions. Board, wait, wait a minute, Mrs. Farrell. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, and, any questions from board members? No. Okay, very good. <coughs> At this time, I'd like to submit a memorandum uh, that's in response to the motion that, Pep, that the appellant made to dismiss, where he cited the UPS case, and we argued about it before the board Thank decided you. to allow us to go forward, but I thought I'd like to have this memorandum, and um, I may refer to that in argument, but... Um, I did want to address that open issue. And with that, I do, I do not have any other witnesses. <coughs> do I have any rebuttal? No rebuttal witnesses? No rebuttal. Mr. Schaefer? No rebuttal. I, I would ask for a 10-minute recess so I could re, 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 uh, and, review And we'll go this. ahead and do that. About a 10-minute recess then. Thank you. Good.
we're going to call the BZA back to order. Um, Mr. Leahy, you want to follow up on your handout before our break? Well, I think it's closing argument time. <laughs> but, but I didn't know if he wanted any, any comments about... We can address my memo and then do closing arguments. He's going to get them during closing arguments. He's going to get comments. I'm fine with reserving closing comments to include my memo as well as other closing comments. That okay. Speed uh, things uh, along. I just didn't want to cheat you out of the opportunity to address that. Thank you. Okay. So with that, presentation of testimony and evidence is now closed and summations are in order. The applicant is first and then interested parties and protestants followed by the applicants rebuttal to complete the presentation of the case. Mr. Leahy. Thank you. I'm going to start with a memorandum that um, I submitted. Please, please remain seated so that we can get your every word recorded. Well, that's easier on me, too, thank, yeah. thankfully. I'm going to start with a memorandum. Um, the board may recall uh, Mr. Schaefer made a motion to dismiss during the last hearing, which the board, I think you reserved on it. I don't think you technically granted it or denied it. I think you might have reserved on it. Reserved. So I wanted to address it. And what Mr. Schaefer uh, referred to uh, in the motion to dismiss is the UPS case, um, which was decided by the Court of Appeals in 1994, which arose out of a Baltimore County transaction. And we believe the UPS case relied upon is clearly distinguishable from what's going on here. So I'm gonna talk about it a little bit. The UPS case involved a Baltimore County zoning commissioner who received a letter from UPS saying, is this proposed use I want to do, is it permitted? And it was a warehouse that UPS wanted to build. And the zoning commissioner actually wrote on the margin of the letter, no, this is fine, it's permitted, and sent it back. Thereafter, um, the Carroll County building engineer, the Baltimore, I'm sorry, the Baltimore County engineer, which is the person with authority to issue building permits, issued a building permit uh, in October of 1986. Well, the permit was issued, uh, UPS began construction, and a citizen wrote a letter to the zoning commissioner, not the building engineer, arguing that UPS had to have a special exception because he argued it was a truck terminal and not a warehouse. The zoning <coughs> administrator responded by saying, no, it remained his opinion, it was permitted, and he wrote a letter January 19, 1987, saying that. The citizens and others then appealed from the letter written in January 1987. The Baltimore County Board of Zoning Appeals uh, permitted the appeal to go forward, but they said it was from the original July 1985 notation that the commissioner had made, and that the reason they let it go forward, even though it was long past 30 days, is they said, we're going to use a d discovery rule that, that is used in statute of limitations cases that because the uh, protestant didn't discover it until much later, we're going to let him do the appeal. Much later, the Court of Special Appeals determined the appeal was appropriate, but they said it was appropriate because it was an appeal from the January 1987 decision by the Zoning Commissioner. Um, ultimately, Maryland's Court of Appeals determined the appeal was not permitted under either theory. And the reason was because the decision in terms of the Court of Appeals was the building engineer's determination to grant the permit. That was never appealed from. That was the applicable uh, thing to be appealed from. The zoning administrator didn't have the authority to do that. And so in January of 87, when the zoning administrator said, I'm not going to reconsider it, there was nothing to appeal from. The reason that case is so distinguished from this case is that in this case, the proper official to make the determination is, in fact, the Carroll County Zoning Administrator. He made that decision in April 19, 2021. No one communicated to interested protestants until more than 30 days was later. Unlike the Baltimore County case, where the interested citizens simply reiterated, we don't think this is proper, we think it needs a special exception, we, in fact, introduced valid new information that we thought the zoning administrator was required to consider. And that new information was detailed in our letter, which is attached to our application. 
And the, the, the new information that was relevant and important was that to be permitted as an accessory use, a commercial vehicle must be actively used by a full-time resident of the single-family dwelling. And we explained to the zoning administrator, we, sh we attached a series of photographs showing the sea container, showing what it was set up at, and we explained that this commercial trailer, so-called commercial trailer, had never been moved, had never been used as a commercial trailer, probably couldn't be used as a commercial trailer, and based on that, we asked Mr. Voigt to reconsider his decision. And he had authority to reconsider the decision, unlike the Baltimore County case. So we believe that this case is properly here, that it should not have been, it hasn't been dismissed, but we ask you not to dismiss it based on Mr. Schaefer's motion, that it's proper for you to hear it, because this case is much different in the case relied upon by Mr. Schaefer. May, may I address is the motion to dismiss? Um, or are you, is that these, your argument? These are, these are his summation comments, Mr. Schaefer. Uh, you'll have the opportunity to rebut those or address those in your summation um, uh, comments. And we will, in all likelihood, in our deliberations, um, uh, rule on that before we make a decision on the case. And I, un I understand that uh, what I thought would be, uh, and it's up to you obviously, would be a, a better, is there's two issues here. One is should the case be dismissed? And the second one is who who wins? If it's not dismissed, is Jay Boyd's decision I, I upheld we, or returned? We, we can take care of them simultaneously. Okay, okay, it's fine. Okay. Thank you. Mo moving to the issue here about whether this is, in fact, a proper commercial vehicle. Again, I return to my August 13th, 2021 letter to Mr. Voigt asking him to reconsider, where we specifically pointed out the commercial vehicle is a trailer. It has not been moved. It is not likely to be capable of being moved, and therefore it doesn't meet the definition within 158.056b. Um, now, since then, uh, we've had the, the trial uh, in January, and uh, we've had today's trial, and I think Mr. Stoms' evidence as an expert witness is compelling. And uh, the board heard it in January. We just addressed an issue about main licensing today, but he has been unequivocal that this commercial trailer is not capable of being legally moved it's not capable for all kinds of reasons. We talked about uh, the wheels, we talked about the axles, we talked about the hitch. He showed you pictures of appropriate commercial trailers such as this C, um, the, the, the C container. You know, they're on massive trailers with heavy support. Uh, they're being moved by tractors with the fifth wheel and they're situated so they're sitting over the the eight double wheels of a tractor trailer. I mean, this is so far removed from that. And then we also have the clear evidence that it's never been moved. And you can see from the pictures from submitted in the earlier hearing, the picture just submitted today, it's sitting there in a field where there's trees, where it's grown up. This is not a commercial trailer being actively used by a resident. And again, for a commercial trailer to be actively used, it has to be used as a commercial trailer. You have to take it out and move things in it. That's what a commercial trailer is. If a commercial trailer can sit forever and never be moved, then that's just a subterfuge to get around the fact that this is a sea container which was not allowed to be used. Um, so I think, I think that the evidence is very clear. This is not a roadworthy legal, it may have been, tagged in Maine, but that is only says, Maine says you got a tag on it. It still has to be a viable commercial trailer capable of being used and being used by the owner to, to fit the accessory. So I we would ask that you um, uh, reverse the decision of Mr. Voigt <coughs> and, uh, and rule that um, in favor of us on the appeal that uh, this is not a bona fide commercial trailer. Thank you. Mr. Schaefer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board. 
Um, the legal determination here on the motion to dismiss is unlike many instances where this board is called on to read the law, get advice on the law, and then apply the facts to the law. And the reason it's different is this is pretty much cut and dried. And I'll explain why I say that in a second. This is not a Schultz v. Pritz, is it harmonious, are there adverse effects? That's the law, and then you get to decide the facts. In this case, the, the facts are very clear. And the facts are that under Section 158.131b, appeals from decisions of the zoning administrator shall be made to the BZA as provided in 158.133d. 158.133d2, the appeal shall be filed, I'm paraphrasing here, appeals shall be filed within 30 days from the date of the action being appealed. Okay? From the date of the action being appealed. Now, uh, uh, the, the UP and the action being appealed is Jay Voigt's decision that this is a legal trailer and it's allowed to stay there. Okay? That's the action being appealed. And in fact, if you read Mr. Leahy's appeal, the last sentence of it is says, this appeal is being made from the zoning administrator's decision not to reconsider, I'll talk about this in a minute, not to reconsider and determining that the Martin C. Container is a commercial trailer permitted as an, as an accessory use under 158.056b. That's the action being appealed. Okay. Now, when was that appeal filed? That appeal was filed, let's see, do I have it on here? September 29th, 2021. That's when the appeal was filed. Now, that had to be within 30 days of the action being appealed, okay? I did a little timeline here. This thing, as you heard from the evidence, this thing started in June of 2020. In April of 2021, the e in, in, according to the email Mr. Leahy introduced, the decision was made, and the decision was, and furthermore, unlike the UPS case, and I'll get to that in a minute, the facts here are much more damning than they are in the UPS case. And I'll tell you what, unlike in the UPS case, the Jordans and the Farrells were in on the thing the whole time or most of the time, toward it, it's, they were copied on these emails, they went to Commissioner Wentz, he got involved, he communicated with them, they were told unequivocally by Wentz, by Scott Robinson, that the decision was made, and they lost, okay? Now, did they file an appeal within 30 days? They didn't file an appeal within four months, five months. Okay, but you know what they did? They had a good lawyer, and that lawyer, without being familiar probably with the UPS case, said, I know how we can get an appeal. He, he knew exactly what the problem was. And he said, I know what we can do. We'll file a letter to Jay Voigt saying, Jay, please reconsider your decision Here's why. And then Jay Voigt sent him a letter back saying, we're not going to, I'm not reconsidering, okay? Um, I'm sticking with the original determination that I made three or four months ago. And then Mr. Voigt's attorney, Mr. Allman, sent Mr. Leahy a letter saying, yeah, you missed your 30 days, bud. Sorry. Now, those are the facts before you today. Uh, and and the, the, the record is replete with communication. So, so the point is this, factually, and not that, I don't even need this, but it sure helps me. The Jordans and the Farrells were well aware that there was a decision being made on this sea container, on this property. I mean, they were in it all over the place. Now, here's what happened in UPS, and if you were confused by Mr. Leahy's argument, uh, here's what happened in UPS. 
UPS went to the Baltimore County Zoning Administrator, they call him a commissioner down there, and said, can we do a, a, a facility on this piece of ground? And the Zoning Administrator said, long story short, said, yes, I think it's a warehouse, it's a permitted use. Now they had attorneys, UPS had attorneys, they got it in writing from the Zoning Administrator, okay? Four, five, six months go by, they come in and get a building permit. This stuff about the building en engineer he's talking about in Baltimore is a red herring. They come in and get a building permit. The zoning administrator signs off on that zoning, on that, on that uh, uh, z building permit. Now, meantime, who's the plaintiff here? Yeah, People's Council, Mr. Mr. Somebody, some neighbor, sometime after that, looks out his window one day and goes, what are those backhoes doing over there? in that field, and he starts inquiring, and he finds out that UPS is putting a trucking a, a facility there, and he calls the lawyer, and the lawyer looks at the zoning law and says, that's not a, and calls, I'm sure calls the zoning administrator and goes, what the hell's going on here? And the zoning administrator says, well, it's a, it's a warehouse, it's a permitted use. They've gotten all their permissions, they got the site plan, whatever they needed, they're good. Guy goes, no, it's not. It's a trucking facility. So he, so he does what Mr. Leahy did. He sends a letter to the zoning administrator. He goes, please reconsider your decision. This is not a warehouse. I've got new information, just like Mr. Leahy says. I've got new information I'd like to present to you. This thing, it can't be actively used, you know, as if Jay didn't know that or whatever. Okay? And, and zoning administrator says, just like Mr. Voigt says, I'm not reconsidering my decision my decision. Here's a letter. I'm not reconsidering my decision. They then file an appeal within 30 days. They had a 30-day appeal period there, too. Th these are very common in, in the zoning field. They file an appeal within 30 days. Long story short, forget about the Court of Special Appeals and everybody else. It goes to the Court of Appeals of Maryland, which is Maryland's highest court, and those are the facts that are laid out. Now, Keep in mind, in that case, it was very clear that the gentleman, I think it was a gentleman, that filed the appeal, that tried to file the appeal, he had no clue what was going on until he saw those, those backhoes out in the field or whatever he saw, until he saw the construction activity. Court of Appeals said, you missed your 30 days, bud. It's a very strict rule. It's not a statute of limitations. There's no discovery rule here. Mr. Lay referred to the arguments that were made to try to get the court to say, you know, you can, you, I didn't know about it. Sorry, you, you are out of court. That's the law of the state of Maryland, a decision by the Court of, the court of Appeals of the highest court. Now, as I say, this situation is pretty much on all fours with this, except for a, the fact that in this case, the Jordans and the Farrells were well aware that this was going, were, and furthermore, were well aware that the decision was made. They sat on their rights. Now, that sounds harsh, maybe, I don't know if it sounds harsh to you or not, it sounds technical, uh, but it's the law, number one. And number two, think of why that law is in effect. If you could appeal zoning administrator decisions, let's assume you knew about them, you know, at any time by just sending a letter in saying, hey, I noticed my neighbor's putting a garage out there. I don't think it's allowed in the zone. Well, meanwhile, you know what the neighbor did? The neighbor went in, got a building permit, got a zoning certificate, hired a contractor, put down a $12,000 deposit, the backhoes are out there, they're digging, the guy says, oh, I'm sorry, I'm appealing that. I got a lawyer, and uh, we, and let's, you know, that, that is why, one, one major reason why this is in. That's not fair. It's not fair to people like Mr. Martin, not fair to anybody to have that system. This is a clear-cut case. This is even better than the UPS case. Um, because they knew about it. This one, there's no real equitable claim that, gee, we got gypped out of it, we didn't know what was going on, this is all done behind closed doors. 
as I said, the emails are replete. They called Commissioner Wance. Commissioner Wance said, sorry, I looked into this. They told, he, Commissioner Wance sent, sent letters, to, sent emails to Mr. Voigt going, how can this be? This doesn't seem right. Um, can you look at this again? Yada, yada. So that's very clear. Um, and I, and I, and it's not a, it's not really, in my opinion, a judgment call in your case for this reason. There's no real dispute as to the facts here. The facts are the appeal was filed on the, the decision was made on or about these dates, you know, when, the, when they're in email. The, the, the email that he put in evidence is one of them uh, in April. Four months, three, four, five months go by, that's when the appeal's filed. So there's no real factual <coughs> leeway here, and the law is clear. Now, uh, I'm going to, uh, if, if you dismiss this case based on that argument, um, I would urge you to go on and consider the merits of the case for the purpose of appellate uh, uh, practice so that if, if it goes to the court and if the court says you're wrong or right or whatever, and then the court says, but, but I don't know how they would have decided on the container itself. I'm just suggesting respectfully that that would be an economical type way so that it doesn't get remanded if it would. Now, the argument on the merits is, is, is quite, this, this stuff, uh, I'm still not sure I understand this stuff, trailer, sea container, licensed vehicle, but I will say this. Um, the evidence shows that this is under 10,000 pounds, and if you look at 158056, the definition of commercial vehicle, this is, this is the section that defines commercial vehicle, shall mean a motorized vehicle of 10,000 pounds or more, well that's not us, we're not motorized, right? A trailer capable of gross vehicle weight of 10,000 pounds or more, capable of, that's a little bit mealy, but it, I mean, I guess, I don't know if it's been proven or not, maybe you could load this thing up, I'm not sure. You heard Mr. Martin's testimony, it, it's limited to 10,000 on the road. Or a trailer which may be used for commercial purposes. Uh, Maybe, I guess, I mean, I guess that's every trailer out there, right? Because if the guy calls you up and says, hey, I'll give you $100 to bring me a, bring me a cow, and you can put a cow in the trailer, I guess that's a commercial purpose. So I get, it's a little bit sloppy, and I got to admit I was on the committee that, uh, that, that drafted these things or helped draft them back in, uh, back in the uh, early 80s uh, because I can tell you that Solway Smith, the old zoning administrator, she used to get a bunch of calls about, my neighbors parked his truck out there, and, I, you know, and, and it's like a, it's a, it's a 18 wheeler. You know, cause, and or my neighbor, and it's like, well, ma'am, that's an Utz, you know, that's an Utz potato chip truck. It's like, the guy does that for a living. He, you know, so she would just, she made up her own rule, which is if the guy drives it and he parks it so he doesn't block sight distance, I'm not, I'm not saying it's illegal. Well, we tried to codify it in this. And you can see that what, what was tried to be done is if you have a bigger lot, you can get more vehicles. And then we put in that actively used. Again, I mean, that's a tough call. Poor Jay Voigt <laughs> trying, to, trying to figure out, you know, what actively used me. But anyway, then it goes on to say, let's assume we are a commercial vehicle under this definition. Then it says commercial vehicles parking one on a lot of an acre or, or l upon a, a lot of one acre or less. We're, li we're a little over an acre, aren't we? Yes. So we're, we can park two commercial vehicles on ours, okay, because we're, we're a greater than one acre. That's the second section. But the same, same criteria starts applying must be actively used by a full-time resident of the dwelling. Okay, he's a full-time resident of the dwelling. He actively uses it for storage. He has not actively used it to take it off the property and drive it since he put it on there. It is what it is. Those are the facts. Nobody tried to fudge it here today, which is a little bit unusual for some of your hearings, um, I think. Uh, <laughs> nobody tried to gild the lily. Uh, you know, you, you've heard them. Uh, the, the commercial vehicle should be parked completely within the boundary lines, no problem there. The commercial vehicle should not be parked such it blocks adequate sight distance, no problems there. 
actively used. That's what, he's, that's what they're saying. It's not actively used, therefore it's illegal under this section. Okay? Now, you've heard testimony. I'm, I believe Mr. Stoms testified it at the beginning. I wrote it down when I listened to it. Some, it would not be illegal to use it on the public roads in his first testimony. Not that, so it could be. We're not denying it has not been used on the public roads. All right. So he gets it licensed, which he thinks, based on conversations, is, is like to solve. Okay? Um, so, and I don't know whether it is or not, but I will say this. The next section of the code, 158057, deals with outdoor storage of unlicensed vehicles. And that says, for the purpose of this chapter, an unlicensed vehicle should mean a vehicle previously licensed or required to be licensed to operate upon the public roads in this state, excluding mobile homes. Okay, previously licensed. Okay, so he's licensed right now, right? Let's assume. He's, he, well, he is. He's got, we, we, got the, we got the pictures. Then it says, one unlicensed vehicle shall be permitted as an accessory use to a residential dwelling upon a lot of three acres or less. That's him, he's three acres or less, okay? So, sounds weird, doesn't it? We'll just take the tag off. He won't be licensed anymore. Now, we've already established, Mr. Mr. Leahy's argued strenuously that he's a commercial vehicle. Note the word vehicle. He's a commercial vehicle. Unlicensed vehicle may be permitted as an accessory use for a residential dwelling lot upon a we're there. So we win. You know, sounds crazy, I know. It's, uh, I don't know if that's the intent or not. But it seems to me that's what it says. Now, one last point, uh, just sort of in general. This is not a covenanted homeowners association community. This is Graves Run Road. This is rural country. This is ag zone property. This is where you might see some things that certain urban dwellers might think are ugly. Um, and, you know, and, and maybe they, you know, it's a matter of personal taste. I don't know. But this is not an egregiously uh, offensive uh, type situation given uh, the area. Now, I know that's not the determinative factor. You're required to look at the law, but I know you also consider the, the general health, safety, welfare concerns, and I would point out to you that in the circumstances of this case, this is not something that should shock somebody's conscience, okay? Maybe not something you would choose, maybe not, but you bought in a rural community, you bought you know, in an area where there's no covenants, and you live there, and you've taken advantage, in many cases, of the looseness of that to park your son's unlicensed, you know, vehicle out there, or maybe a couple motorcycles, whatever. So, in summary, I think it's very clear that this case should be dismissed because they didn't file within 30 days of the action being appealed from. And Mr. Leahy's own own appeals papers says he's appealing from Mr. Voigt's refusal to reconsider. Sorry, you just don't get those extra bites at the apple. You sat on your rights, you were involved in the situation for a year, for about a year or so. If it was that important to you, you should have either called a lawyer or done something else. It's fairly harsh, but we've got to end somewhere. We've, these decisions have to be and that's what the Court of Appeals said. So I thank you for your attention uh, to this case. Mr. Leahy, do you have any um, rebuttal? I certainly do. Um, I'm, I'm amused that, that Mr. Schaefer is talking about how my clients were well aware uh, about this licensing of a commercial vehicle. They were strenuously involved, the Jordans especially, in keeping track of, and, and that's in the record in terms of the, all, the, all the, uh, the, the zoning administrator's notes, they were very much on top of it because 
he kept getting, he, he'd get a six month hardship, then you get a two month extension, another two month extension. So in that record, you'll see the Jordans in March said, what's going on? Oh, he got another two months extension. Then before that, about the time that two month extension was up was when Mrs. Jordan emailed Scott Robertson on May 24th and said, what's going on? Did you give him another extension? And for the first time, they were told, oh, no, it's a commercial vehicle. It's completely legal. So this well aware is just not factually accurate. So I want to go over the timeline a little bit. April 19th, Jay Voigt determines it's a commercial vehicle and period, permitted as a matter of right. May 26th, more than 30 days later, and they had to inquire about it. The Jordans are told, oh, no, it was already granted. So it's already too late for them to do anything. August 13th is when I write a letter to Jay Voigt asking him to reconsider the decision he made in April. And I presented him with lots of new information he did not have in April. Now, Mr. Schaefer argued that the Baltimore County case was very similar because they presented new evidence. Well, that record doesn't show they presented new evidence because they didn't. They asked the exact same thing of the, of the Baltimore County Zoning Administrator. Hey, doesn't this need a special exception? And the administrator said, no, they gave him no new information. So this is entirely different. And as I've argued in my memorandum, and this is also important, uh, Mr. Voigt was the decision maker, uh, unlike in Baltimore County. Uh, where the zoning administrator was not the zoning, was not the uh, decision maker for the building permit issue, it was a building engineer. So, he was given a letter with new information, August 13th, 21, it was September 17th, 21, where he said, I've considered your new information, I'm still not gonna reconsider, I'm gonna stick with where I am, and then the appeal was taken from that in a timely basis, so this really is for the reasons I've already put in my written memo, I'm not going to bore you with it. It's already very much distinguished from the UPS case, so the motion to dismiss should not be granted. Um, and uh, as for this new information about 158.056 and this sort of questioning that maybe that didn't apply, well, it better have applied because that's the basis of which Zoning Administrator Voigt said you were accessory use. That was his determination. And it talks about uh, a trailer capable of gross vehicle weight 10,000 pounds or more, which this clearly is capable of more than that. The fact that he sticks a sticker on it and says it's going to be 9,800 to keep under the law, and he never moves it and is probably not capable of moving it, uh, you know, doesn't, doesn't change that. So we would ask that you deny the motion to dismiss and rule in our favor on the merits. Thank you. Okay, the hearing and record of this case is now closed and in accordance with the Open Meetings Act of Maryland, the board will now consider the case. And I think we should, before we, before we actually decide the case, we should um, address Mr. Schaefer's um, request that the uh, case be dismissed. We reserve that. So let's, let's hold our comments to that at this particular point in time. We heard the timelines. I was going to ask the other way around. Hmm? I was going to ask it the other way around. Um, <clears throat> I, I think we need to, since we reserved the decision on the um, request to dismiss. I think we should discuss that first. Okay. I'm a little confused. <laughs> oh, <under> my word. <laughs> I'm a little confused about the notification. So <clears throat> I understand I, I can follow this, this trail and I can follow the, the information that was proffered um, and on May 26 the letter came from Scott Robinson but then then on 
June 17th, a follow-up letter was sent that Mrs. Farrell was clearly copied on from Commissioner Wance. So saying that, you know, this has been decided, the staff has done the correct work, the decisions were appropriate, um, and everything's on spot, that Mr. Void had done what was appropriate. So looking at the 30-day timeline, if we even if we accept that this official notice, and I don't I don't even know that an email from Commissioner Wentz serves as official notice. I, I don't I don't know what's appropriate there. Um, the notice wasn't sent for almost two months. So that's I'm a little bit confused about the timeline. Maybe I'm not confused. Maybe my question is, even if they didn't know in May. They knew in June. They knew June 17th. I mean, I think it's, I think this email is clear that in June 17th, they knew. That, that's, a, that's the point in time which Commissioner Wance emailed the Jordans and Mrs. Farrell. That's constructive notice. It's not actual notice. Um, it's not an official communique from the county. But it was, it was from the commissioner. Does an email make it official? It could come from anywhere. Mr. Dixon? <laughs> is an email... What's the question? Is, is, is an email official notification if it's coming from a county commissioner? I think it can be. So you're, you're saying it can be? That, that's what I'm saying. To clear things up for you? Well, and I mean, that's my question. Is this an official notification? Did, did they, I mean, at that point, yep. but I will happily listen to anything anybody else has to say. What are you looking at me for? <laughs> Either Richard or Dick, one of, one of the All two. Right. Of them. Okay. Um, if we take the, the email from the commissioner as being de facto notice, actual notice, mm -hmm. then you know the 30-day the rule applies. It does not allow them to appeal. There's a sizable gap here. You know, it's we're talking about the uh, what's the date of the commissioner's message again? The 17th of June. 17th of June. It's still the attorney's letter goes out August 13th. So it's almost two months. <clears throat> so, you know, as has been stated, 30 days is 30 days. It's not flexible in that respect. So I'm inclined to support the uh, the contention that the, the time period had elapsed, and there was sufficient evidence to suggest that, you know, if there was a, a real problem, if this person really did have a problem with it, then they should have consulted an attorney much earlier in the game to uh, to deal with this, rather than let their 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 rights lapse, as is, has been the case. Mr. Simmons. I'm inclined to support uh, the zoning administrators, administrators' determination to allow a sea container as a permitted accessory use. I don't, I don't see any evidence that says we should overturn that. And Mr. Dixon, I've got a legal question for you. If we, if, if we make a decision on 
the appeal of the zoning administrator's ruling. The C container was a vehicle approved as an accessory use. Then would it be a moot point about the um, request from Mr. Schaefer to dismiss the case because of the 30 day rule? Okay, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, are, you, are you saying that if you don't think the appeal was timely and that you, you think that will resolve the case right there? No, I was saying if we if we rule on the case on, on what's before us, the appeal is any administrator's ruling that a sea container was a vehicle and approved as an accessory use. If we if we act on that first. Can we act on that first and then act on the uh, move for dismissal by Mr. Schaefer? Well, I thought you were going to address the motion to dismiss I, first. I know, but I'm just asking. Do. And then yeah. still so you can, you can still, I think you should do it that way. <laughs> Deal with the motion to dismiss first. Okay. And then, I mean, are, are there any other facts that support what you what you you said in the, the motion to no I I just I I just want to throw that out there I, I'm 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 going to say this the, the the timelines here are very confusing and I'm looking at this from the zoning administrator's office point of view if the circumstances change the original complaint was that it was a sea container and there had been extensions and everything else and then it was converted to a trailer that according to the zoning administrator and his inspector met the letter of the law um, maybe there was an issue there with notification because not everybody knew at what stage the trailer was, whether it was a sea container or whether it was a trailer. And I use those two terms. That, that, that 30 days can be problematic. But at the same time, on June 17th, Commissioner Wance sent an email to the interested parties saying that he had investigated this uh, through the zoning administrator's office and he said everything appears to be legal and maybe the code needs to be changed so that's an indication to me that it was determined by more than one person and probably with some legal input that it met the letter of the law so i'm really torn on whether to go with the motion to dismiss the case based on the 30-day time period just because of the notification timing and the timing of the sea container becoming a trailer according to the code um mr chairman can i add something absolutely as long as it's to us and not to them <laughs> to you it's looking at uh, 158 056 it doesn't say anything here about it actually being roadworthy or being used on the road. I, it just says it has to be used by the resident. By the owner, which is used using it as he sees fit. Yeah, and, and I... It's very loose. I mean, I, 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 we'll get into that discussion later, too, but, I mean, what, what we need to decide here is... Um, 30 day the, the, well, the 30 days, the, the request from Mr. Schaefer to dismiss the case based on the 30 days had lapsed. Well, the, if the uh, email from the commissioner is accepted as the uh, uh, actual notice, Ms. Farrell at that point you know, uh, is an interested party. She's been notified, and the 30-day clock starts. I... Yeah, I, I, I still. I, I I feel that they missed the thirty days. I, right. I, I I do, and um, there were some circumstances there. Like I said, that that maybe the notification didn't go from the zoning administrator, but when you go from a sea container to a trailer, 
in the eyes of the zoning office, um, maybe there was maybe they didn't know when the 30 days started either. I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure what the intent was there. Um, Ms. Eckerd, anything else? Because we need we need to. I think the clock started on June seventeenth. Okay, and I, that's when I think the clock started. Also, I agree. There, that it's a solid time frame that we know yeah. that they were notified on June seventeenth. Okay. Any further discussion here? I'll entertain a motion uh, concerning the motion to dismiss. Motion just. Motion to dismiss by Mr. Schaefer. You're looking for a, um, a, motion? a motion? Yes. O on on just the motion to dismiss. All right. In case number. 635, the continuation of case number 6355 before the Board of Zoning Appeals. The board uh, confirms that the uh, motion to dismiss be upheld. Do I have a second? Do we need to grant it? <clears throat> Do we need to grant it or upheld? Uphold it. Well, Mr. Dixon, grant or uphold, which would be the proper? language uh, I would say uh, grant grant okay say it again please oh gosh you would do that uh, that in hmm. six three five five that in the case in that in the continuation of case number six three five five before the board of zoning appeals that the motion to dismiss be granted Okay, do I have a second? Second. Okay, further discussion on this motion. Okay, all in favor, aye. 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 All opposed, no. Motion carries. Now, out of an abundance of caution, we're going to go ahead and uh, have a motion on the appeal of the Zoning Administrator's ruling that a sea container was a vehicle and approved as an accessory use. I'd like to say the, the, the one thing that um, Mr. Schaefer pointed out in the, the zoning code it doesn't even need to be tagged in the state of Maine. Harold. Huh? Uh, oh, oh, no, in, in, it doesn't even need to be a tagged vehicle on his lot. I mean, mean like if, if it's not a legal tagged yes. vehicle they could take the tag off and then it becomes yeah legal yes so i mean and number one well, it says previously licensed well so it's it's been previously there, licensed there, there you go yeah. take the tags off today and she's previously licensed so either way it it works we, we don't have jurisdiction over what is main tagged it was that that's that's main's problem as far as I'm concerned, and Mr. Martin filled out the proper paperwork and got tags in Maine. And uh, if you've ever been to a livestock sale, um, most of them have green and white tags on the livestock trailers. And whether they're ones that pulled behind a pickup or ones that are pulled behind a uh, tractor tra or a road tractor, so there, there's a there's a boatload of them out there. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, I actually have a trailer that has main tags. Um, I hope you had a 17-digit VIN number. Um, I didn't hear that. Um, so what we need to do here is is look at, in in my opinion, what 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 has occurred. It was a sea container it became a trailer as determined by the zoning administrator and the zoning inspector. And with that, it's what Mr. Martin is doing up there is with that container is legal according to our code. 
he meets the letter of the law. I'll just leave it at that. Is Secretary anything? I don't think so. No. Mr. Colwell? Nope. You're going to let me speak for you all? You fools. Okay. Very good. I'll entertain a motion. In the case of continuation of case number 6355 before the Board of Zoning Appeals, the board concurs with the the uh, determination of the zoning administrator. You want to continue that? To allow the C container. To allow the C container uh, is a uh, an approved accessory use. Permitted accessory use. Permitted. Um, That's what it says. Yeah. I beg your pardon. That's I'm okay. Trying, try this again. We just try That's to get off it off of this. That's off of this. Oh, I was getting it off of this. Yeah. Which one do you want me to use? This one? This one? Yep. No. All right, try this one third time. Okay. In the continuation of case number 6355 before the Board of Zoning Appeals, the Board hereby confirms the Zoning Administrator's ruling that a sea container was a vehicle and approved as an accessory use. Do I have a second? I'll second. Any further discussion on the motion? <clears throat> Seeing none, all in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Motion carries. Our oral decision will become final upon a written decision which will be issued within 30 days unless this board ex uh, extends it. The board's decision will be, may be appealed by filing a petition for judicial review with the clerk of the Circuit Court of Carroll County in accordance with the provisions of Chapter 200, Title 7 of the Maryland Rules of Procedure. The appeal must be filed within 30 days of the date of the Board's written decision. Thank you very much, and this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>